So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us in today's event entitled The Road Ahead, European SMEs and Their Path to Scaling Up. My name is Ivana Ray Almora, a Policy and Project Officer in URADA, and I will be with you throughout today's event. Um, so this event is held in the framework of the Interreg Europe Scale-Up Project, which we will get to know more about throughout the morning. Um, so first, to give you some housekeeping rules, please ensure that the microfo your microphones are switched off to avoid noise interference. And you are also all encouraged to ask a question orally by simply um, unmuting yourselves at the appropriate time. So later on, we will have some portions for Q&A. Um, and I will give you the signal for this. Um, and when asking a question, please go straight to the point so that we can ensure more interaction between the speaker and other participants. And um, you already received the notification that this um, session is being recorded and will be published um, at Ureda's website. And now, um, just to give you a brief idea of how um, today will go, um, we, will be have, we will be having several speakers to talk about a variety of topics. And so we seem to have a very packed agenda. Um, and because of that, let us um, go on to our opening remarks. So please help me welcome um, the director of the European Association of Development Agencies. Um, he has been working um, in Urada since 2015. And before that, he worked in the Regional Development Agency of Murcia to coordinate the Regional Network of Technology Centers. Um, so please help me welcome Dr. Um, Esteban Pelayo. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for the, the invitation, despite I am up. Uh, Urada is uh, one of the advisory partners of this project. I have been involved only in the first part of the, of the project, and I appreciate that I will be here to learn from, the, from all the best practice that this project has uh, achieved. I had the impression that you have had, uh, the partners of the project, you have had a very good dynamic in order to exchange ideas about how to support the scale-up of companies, which is at most relevant in, in today's uh, life. So I, I want to recall you accordingly with the experience of the, of the, of the development agencies during the, the 30 years that we have been created as an association, that the scale-up is not an easy task. It's something of the most uh, difficult support that we could provide for the economic growth in, in a territory. From our experience, it, it is important to combine the different aspects of the, of the scale-up. So scale-up is not only about innovation, but as well about internationalization because doesn't have companies doesn't have any sense to, to go to the local market. Normally they go abroad in order to pay back with their with the incomes of the new niche markets, the the the, the, the investment done in innovation. And from the other side, the companies which are very well internationalized, they are exposed to a high competition and they are forced to innovate. And in this context, we as well have to provide as a public authority, a good finance, enough skills, attraction of talent, and probably infrastructure as well, logistic infrastructure, or which is more and more relevant, knowledge infrastructure, how to have a, an applied research. You are going to see during this morning many of these practices, bringing together different actors in a territory that has been achieved by the partners of this excellent project, Scala, which is as well very relevant because justify well what is the leadership of the public organization that are involved in this project and in any other uh, regional development activities in, in territories. <laughs> we need to intervene in our, in, our, in our territories. There is a need of public intervention and we need to be the leaders. And now it's more and more relevant. I, I will, everybody discuss about the twin transition, what is the transition for a circular economy and the digital transition as a as an enabler. And in that sense, we demonstrate and shows how we have to support those companies that are lagging behind and, and to catch and to help them to catch up those that are uh, the first and, and the most innovative ones in, in our territories. So in, in digitalization, for example, we have a, a, a big challenge. So we we, we know that they are, and it's part of the 21 report of SMEs issues by, by, the, 
by the European Commission that is going to issue a report every year that there are countries that they still are lagging behind compared with others. So I, I'm going to say you, Belgium, sorry, Bulgaria, uh, Greece, Hungary, Italy, Latvia, Poland, Romania, Slovakia. So are the countries that are lagging behind compared with the with the rest? And digitalization is an, a big enabler to to facilitate the future competitiveness. So I think we we should do that, and as well in 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 circular economy and 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 sustainability. We have organized recently a, an event about how to support impact. Uh, Impact, a big conference to, to be said, an international conference, how to support impactful uh, investment in, in companies. And there we invited the international experts and the priorities are the same. We have experts from Japan, from the States, from development agencies in those territories. The priority on these days is to use our economy, sustainability, not only because of the benefit for the environment, but because it provides a lot of opportunities for companies to grow. So this is something where we, as a regional development agencies or end public entities supporting the economic growth should, should go. I'm going to give you a, a vision of the contest and I will finish in, in one or two minutes, uh, Miss Moderator. The first one, uh, my first impression is that we are in a very important moment in, 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 it's not only because of the crisis, but because we are starting a, a, the crisis recovery, but because as well we are starting the programming period in, in the European Union. Those territories that will go better after this, uh, this crisis will compete in, in, in a better way in the future. So we have the responsibility as an expert of regional development to help our policymakers to, to design accurate policies in order to help all companies well. And that's why this project is very timely and very important. So you have finished now and you are now implementing in your, in your uh, structural funds what you have learned in this, during these years. So try not only to, to, to go in, inside of you, but as well to span your lessons learned to, to other people, because the, 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 the better we support our companies in this moment, the better we, we will go in, in the future. And there are a lot of opportunities. As you know, the recovery funds are there, close to uh, two, two trillion of, of euros. However, they are challenged. And, and we, I don't want to put only the, the positive things. Most of the funds are still managed centrally without uh, helping the people who are connected and close to the companies to get those funds. This is one of the challenges that we have to overcome. Another one is to go faster. The companies need the money now, the, the support. So we have started already. The period is 21, 27. The recovery funds are there. So we have the responsibility to lead them and as well to connect, to, to align them with other initiatives. And there, the, the involvement of the civil society and all the economic actors in our territory is very relevant. We have done in the territories and smart specialization strategy. Let's use that. Let's believe in what we thought that is a common vision for, for our territories. And accordingly with that, establish a good policy mix, a good uh, a set of action that will lead to have a a good and recovery. I, I think that there are many uh, territories that are doing this path very, very well. And they, the, those that are gathering all the actors in the territory, establishing a really comprehensive set of measures, supporting the economic growth in, in the companies will benefit more than, than others. So let's do that. And for that, this policy learning initiative and this, uh, this event is going to be it's, going, it's very useful and, and let's learn. So I, I don't see anything more, Like, but thank you very much. And we have a complex year 2022 to implement all the, all the things that we have already designed and, and set up during, during the past year. And I hope we will be very useful for the benefit of our societies and our companies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Esteban, for being with us this morning and for your words. Um, to further um, develop on that,
help me welcome um, the Department Head of European Projects of the Regional Development Agency of Murcia, um, where he also supports the business development of the region of Murcia, in particular regarding the stimulation of the regional business community to take part and take advantage of the programs of the European Union, promoting participation in projects financed by community institutions and also the lead partner of the Scala project, Rafael Atas. Rafa, the screen is yours. Many thanks, Ivana, for your introduction. Also to Stefan for the kind, welcoming words that he has expressed. Thanks very much for uh, attending the meeting today. It is uh, a, a real pleasure to uh, be here with you. Uh, the topic for today is supporting small and medium-sized enterprises. That is a goal that uh, six uh, territorial partners in Europe, plus the advisory partner, URADA, have uh, put together in order to support the scaling up of businesses in the regional uh, atmospheres. Uh, by doing so, we are willing much to, uh, to uh, deal with uh, the different ranges of support that uh, regional development agencies and business oriented bodies are implementing and supporting SMEs in, in the partner regions in order to contribute to the European competitiveness and acceleration of a regional uh, and a global e economy. Stakeholders have been also uh, motivated to enter this exercise as this is a concrete example on networking, how the cooperation between regions merits to be uh, opposed and put into evidence as a good tool for scaling up of businesses. We have uh, counted on the uh, technical and financial support of the uh, Interreg uh, Europe uh, program uh, which provided us with uh, budget, time frame, and guidelines in order to pursue this objective of supporting competitiveness and the scaling up of businesses over the last uh, two years, and it will be as it will be also the case in the year to come. Uh, in this context, uh, just very quick review on the uh, partners coming from the Mediterranean. There is uh, partners in Attica, Greece, in Lazio, Italy in uh, Murcia, Spain, uh, in Central Europe, like Lubelski in Poland, uh, Nordhessen in Germany, and uh, uh, Nottingham in the United Kingdom, as well as our territorial partner, which is URADA, the Association of Development Agencies located in Brussels. What we have been implemented over the last two years, there are a battery of actions, in particular four uh, uh, specific actions. First, the interregional learning process based on the best practices uh, identified in the six partner territorial regions as a real proof on how the regions are supporting small and medium enterprises to boost out, to innovate, to grow in the international and European context. All those practices have been shared with uh, the stakeholders, action groups created in uh, each one of the six partner regions in order to enable such uh, interregional policy and learning component, which is based on uh, study visits and peer reviews uh, implemented over the last, uh, last year. Uh, we have achieved to uh, um, produce six regional action plans, territorial partners that I've just mentioned in the previous slide, based on this uh, interregional policy learning uh, to confront the, uh, the exercise for the year to come. We have developed and identified a, a wide range of good practices, which have been selected as best practices by the project and also by the Interreg program itself. All the territorial partners in Murcia, Hessen, Attica, Lazio, Lubelski and Nottingham, with the external support of, the, of URADA, have identified a range of uh, good practices in the regions concerning, well, access to funding, innovation support, uh, entrepreneurial uh, support, uh, business nets and infrastructures, uh, access to markets and internationalization, a wide range of practices that you can uh, see in, in front of you nominated in this slide were identified at the beginning of the project in order to be shared by all the partners. How we have shared that, as it is in line with the direct program, we have 
developed a number of study visits. The only study visit we implemented on site, it was in Lubelski in early 2020. Then pandemic exploded and we were confronted to adapt a new methodological tool, which was the online study visits in which we have held uh, 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 online uh, uh, practical visits to the other five partner regions, starting by the compilation of uh, information concerning the good practices identified, identified the analysis of party regions, uh, the uh, post of questions in order to be clarified by the uh, partner regions, the celebration of online study visits for a couple of hours, uh, all the regions together, uh, enabling the presentation of the uh, three good practices per region with the assistance of online uh, tools in order to uh, enable that uh, Non-travelers, non-real travelers may uh, visit uh, or online visit the uh, the other partner regions, and to get familiar with the practices that they have identified. Then the SWOT analysis and the final revision has been implemented. This methodology has been promoted upstairs to the Interreg uh, program, and it has been shared to other projects as a good tool that uh, yeah, reconverts somehow the difficulty, let's say the impossibility to meet due to pandemic and the need to uh, transform uh, this project and this approach into uh, on, online activities. So sometimes uh, on, on site, some, uh, the majority of times uh, uh, by telematic me means, we have been putting together all the partners and, and working together. Uh, um, in parallel to uh, the uh, uh, online visits, we have developed uh, also online peer reviews as soon as the, uh, every single partner region has, get, has got inspiration from the uh, best practices from other partners, they have uh, posed uh, the interest in one or two specific um, uh, practices, and we have developed uh, peer reviews in order to enable uh, further the, the access to further information, qualified and quantified information, the contact, the access to direct um, um, stakeholders and managers of the good practices in order to take advantage of the experience collected by the, 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 uh, the regions and enable this uh, in form of peer reviews. This process concluded uh, last uh, spring and now it's time to pass through to the second uh, to the, uh, uh, um, topic and action, which is the preparation of action plans uh, uh, on the ground of uh, uh, the uh, within the partnership on the ground of the good practices selected by each uh, territorial region in the project. Uh, we, the partners, have uh, implemented and prepared an action plan which has been uh, submitted for approval to the Interreg program and obtained such an approval. Now it's time to conclude this exercise of preparing action plans, which was uh, the case over the last uh, six months. And now we will start from uh, the beginning of 2022 with implementation of these action plans that are focused to demonstrate the link with the regional policy learning, the selection or the identification and selection of the best practices to be transferred from an exporter region to the importer region, the design of those actions, the players which are uh, involved in, in the prosecution, the time frame, the costs and funding and so on. So it's now time to undertake such an action plans that have been received the green light from the Interreg program joint secretariat. And you will become familiar with those plans uh, from now on. So uh, I am transferring the, the, the floor to Ivan as well in order to have the, the, uh, the kickoff presentation uh, from the uh, European Commission. And if you remain uh, well seated in front of your uh, computer, you will get uh, further information on how the five partner regions have been implemented this procedure and how the action plan in each region is uh, looks like, right? Exactly. Thank you Thank very much. You. Thank you, Rafa. Um, 
so our audience better sit tight and later on we will get to know more about the different regions involved in the scale up project but before that to further set the scene and to talk about how regional collaboration can be a key in closing the scale-up gap, please help me welcome Rudy Ernut, a senior economist at the Directorate General for Internal Market, Industry, Entrepreneurship, and SMEs of the European Commission. Rudy, the screen is yours. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. I will all call you today now, Esteban set the scene. Um, it's nice for me to talk to together with Jurada because I've been working with Jurada a long time and we created together a spin-off which is called Avan with Business Engine Network. So Jurada was really something very dynamic. Uh, thank you, Esteban. Uh, and thank you, Rafael, for all the support on that. Uh, and, and I think it's very important to scale up. So what I'm going to do today, but will be the most boring moment of the seminar. I will start by giving some facts and figures on scale-ups. Then we'll start by saying what are we doing on the policy level mm -hmm. and what could be the, the, the role of the regions and um, as the moderator said, the, the, the chat box, please, it's open, so react. And I will now share my screen to show you some nice slides, uh, hopefully. Um, so I need to start from scratch. Um, there's still some people who are not muted, so it gives some resonance. So please take care that you're muted. So we speak thanks again for the region of Murcia as well. And for Arada. So the first thing, facts and figures. Look. We compare always, I don't, I don't know it's a good thing, but you always look to, to, to the United States as well. And what do we see? If you look to, we ask companies on, on startups, what are your problems? And you see what the Americans say and what the Europeans say. Well, in fact, normally what we see, in fact, is external finance remains one of the most important elements, both in Europe and in US on startups. Now, if you look more on scale-ups, there we see that the problem is much more outspoken much more outspoken in Europe than it is in the United States. I would even say, if you look to Europe for scale-ups, there are two main problems. The one is availability of staff, and the second one is scale-up financing. You see, again, it's much more outspoken in Europe. And of course, we have other problems like business regulation, business support, uncertainty, but the two main are external finance and, first of all, availability of staff. Well, if you look, what are the problems in financing? I think if you look to the life cycle of a company, because I've seen in your best practice, Raphael, you spoke about incubators and so, the problem is, in fact, that we have, first of all, once it starts, it's easy to find some regional money. Then looking for uh, 500,000 to 1 million, what we call the early stage gap, is a problem. The second problem is the scale-up gap. And the third problem is going on the stocks. These are the three problems in financing and the three potential gaps where a company could get bust or not get to the next round. The fourth, so we have three challenges, early stage, scale up, IPO. And the fourth one is the mentality. Because we see that most, if you compare growth of companies, a lot of our companies are having a steady state growth. You have less bankruptcy, which is good, but you have less fast growth. So this is the mentality, the growth mentality. So I think it's important for scale up as well that we say it's not only about money, it's about what is between the ears as well. And that's, of course, much more difficult to work on. And if you compare what the big problem is, and you see the red line, the red line series D plus is really scale up, scale up. Then there is money in the United States, which is the red one. And you see that Europe, which is the dark blue one, it's almost at the same level as China, but it's much less than the United States. And if you look to series A, B, C, I could conclude that the big problem, in fact, in Europe is no longer seed and startup, but it's really scale up. And that's where we work on. So that's why scale up Europe is so important. And you see this gap is not getting closer with, with the COVID. The gap is widening. Then you see the average fund in Europe. The average fund in Europe is something like 100 billion. Um, it's 100 million, sorry. And in the United States, it's 160. Now, the average needs for a scale up in Serie D, so scale up phase, is between 15 and 25. So if you have a fund of 100 million, you cannot afford to put 25 million into one company. So management, 10%. So this means if I, as a, in, in a company in Europe, I have to raise 25 million, I need at least to convince three, four VC funds in Europe. Convincing three, four funds at the same time, as most of you might know, is a quite difficult issue to do. So the one big problem is our funds are small. The second point, I look to my, my words on the left, dry power. 
money which is there to invest. If I look only the 15 biggest US funds, only the 15 biggest, they have now 500 billion, which is more than the GDP of Belgium, ready to invest. Of course, that the money will be invested in scale-ups in Europe. Again, and I told you that it will merge with facts and figures, then we can really do a, an action plan as it was. 2020, the United States invested 140 billion scale-up. Europe, 24. If you look to the new unicorns 2020, in the world, you have 113 unicorns, new ones. Huh? Don't speak about the existing one. New ones 2020. Out of which, UK is fortune, unfortunate that they are longer there, but nothing embassy is in your, your network. Four in Europe, 27. 83 in the United States. So really, the, the problem is getting them big and getting them big fast. And then you see that the fundraising, although the fundraising in Europe, it's, it's, it's going slow. And we still have to do something to need those big funds. As I said, big funds is big money for scallops. And you see all these companies, and you might recognize some of them, they have all one thing in common. Do you know what? They all find the money in the United States. And most of them have put their headquarters there and left there. So it's a pity, you know, because it's our companies. So, and then you see that the success rate in the United States is now 30% higher than in Europe for scallops. And one of the main reasons is, of course, of course, of course, money. You see Europe out of 100, 11 are really successful, United States X16. That's a big difference, of course, between 16 and 11. One place to be in Europe, sorry for uh, the president of Murcia, it's not Spain, it's not Belgium, it's not Germany, but you see that, in fact, you can today, following the study of McKenzie, the biggest multiple is in Eastern Europe and in Southern Europe. So there you are. You are in the good place um, and not in the, in the basic core, not in the core countries like, like France, like Germany. And you see United States, the return is low. Huh? So we, we have something to offer to investors, namely a good return. And I think we should really play to that as a basic economy. The return is there. The return is in the Southern Europe. The return is in Eastern Europe. That's where you can make money as a VC. And I think you should use and abuse the study and everything you want to convince investors. Now, to conclude the first part, the problem is not, is not startup. Europe, out of 100 startups last year, 36 were in Europe, 45 United States. If you look at the percentage to the unicorns, and this includes United Kingdom, we are 14%. We should be there. So that's why scale-up is so important. And again, the big challenge is it's funding, it's stuff. Um, I will not go to that. If not, I think we we'll lose too much time. And let's move to the policy implications. What are the policy implications? We have the European Innovation Council, which you all know, which is quite unique because we invest there. In, but again, it's in starting companies. And we have, of course, the new Invest EU, uh, which you can't forget all these acronyms where you all have been working on so hard for a long time. And we have now very four, four axes. I think most of you know them. But four axes, again, we do a lot of things which are based on the starting phases of companies. Huh? We still say that the market failure is there, although I just proved that the market failure is really scale up. And that's, I hope it's scale up Europe. You can more and more show that. Now, one, one big issue and one big problem in my view, and I think we are all, as all regions, a bit guilty, guilty in the positive sense, more than 30%, 30%, this one, of all venture capital in Europe is public money. This is a danger, of course, because if you have a lot of public money, it's very hard to attract private money. Private money does not always come where the public is. And one third for me, that's really something high. So we have to find other ways to intervene than just put money. And I give you one example, friends. This is the, the sector of space. Some of your regions are really involved. And we see a lot of people are there in the beginning uh, to say, we're going to help you. But once you have a marketable product, there's no one there for the scale up. And I could take other sectors. We focus too much on startup and we don't focus enough on, on scale up. Um, you see, these are the classical programs we have as co investment, uh, which you do together with European Investment Fund. And I think you all know of them because most of you are involved in those projects. We have now, so normally it's equity and we take part of the equity, just like if you is doing or just like uh, uh, the BPI France is doing and so on. Well, now we have a new program, which is Escalar, which will be part of InvestEU. And I will draw your attention to that the program. What is the difference? 
The difference is that on top of the equity, we give the same amount in quasi equity. What is quasi equity? Means the return is capped, but the risk is limited as well. And the whole idea is to trigger private money funds for pension funds to put them into these funds. And if you could double the capacity of the venture capital funds by putting pension funds, that's what we should do at each level and having those bigger funds. Classical schemes, there is a danger of crowding out now. We have leverage and volume, we have co-investment. With this SLR scheme, it's non pari parcel. So we have equity shares, but you have leverage on the return because if the return for the quasi equity is lower, the return for the equity is higher. So it's easy. And secondly, we have capital, capital return covered risk. And so we want to attract pension funds. And that, that's one thing which is an uh, investor use of the regions um, to do something that's called as big. So it normally you should work together with different regions. So for those who are technical in 2VC, with an SCLA return is lower, but the return for the LP is higher than if you compare it with, with the classical co-investment scheme, which is the yellow one. SCLA, you have two parts, one with a lower return, one with a higher return. And so this means you can attract easily private money and you can attract patient investors, just like pension funds who cannot permit by solvency to take high risks. So you can attract them and therefore double the capacity of the funds. I spoke about facts and things about the policy and now I want to open the debate and I hope you, you can react on the chat box on the regional dimension. I think the first thing we have is the governance paradox. And then you can, of course, agree and disagree. I showed you that we need big funds. But on the other hand, regional authorities and national authorities, we always think in terms of borders. Huh? We want to invest in a fund that only invests in our region. But this is not possible. Because you invest in scale-ups, you cannot have these limited borders. So that's the first governance paradox we should think about how to cope with it. The second one is a bit what I call the virtues of vir virtue circle. It depends where you are. To have a scale-up, you need big funds. To have a big fund, you need a big market. So you cannot say, I will have a big fund, but that fund can only invest, produce, and sell in Murcia. This is not possible, of course. You see, if you want a big fund, you say, we must work Spain, Europe, and even beyond. So therefore, regions should collaborate. And of course, in the perfect solution, and I don't know if it's possible, we should have some big multi-region scale-up funds who are focusing on companies investing in different regions and hopefully with a quite big flexibility on the regional limitation to work on. That's of course something which is not easy. I will give an example. So this, this, this if you look to, to the funds, for instance, that's something which triggers me quite a lot. Look US funds. US funds invest in United States, 70%. China funds invest in China, 75%. European funds, only 52% of the European funds goes to European-based companies. So I explained to you that the funds are small, and on top of that, they invest outside Europe. So what should we do? We look to what happened today. What is happening today? We always said companies are moving. 45% yeah? of the scale-ups are moving to the United States to find money. Since COVID, we see something different. We see that US funds are investing in scale-ups in Europe. Look at the figures, the shocking figures. In 2011, 10 years ago, we had 359. Now we have 1,434 companies, scale-ups, invested by US companies in Europe. It was 2.7 billion, now it's 50 billion. If you look 2020, if I only focus on the scale-up round, so I forget startup seed early stage, those who are raising money for scale-up, 75 of them, there was US money involved. So there might be a problem that those big guys, and I gave you some examples of names with the big dry power, which I said to you, they're now coming to US, to, United, to, to Europe, because then the valuation of the company is lower. And therefore we did urgently, I don't want to make a political statement of that, but urgently we need to have scale up and scale up funds so that our funds can invest into our companies. And I give two examples. I spoke about IBA. There was a study of Colin Mason last year saying, what is the problem? And there I think you have a crucial role as regions. The first thing is we don't invest in other regions because we don't have the information. 
The second element is, yes, but, you know, we prefer to be close that we can follow, that for angels. Eh? And the third one is that the tax incentives mostly are linked to local investments by local people. So that's a constraint. If you look to venture capital, what we see, again, lack of information. And that's something, how can we inform um, that, for instance, somebody from Madrid, there's a nice project in Murcia, or somebody from Paris or from Barcelona. So we have to have this, this information. The knowledge of the regional market. An investor knows his own region, but not the region next door. And then the third problem is that a lot of times the public regional participation requires, which is normal from the political point of view, requires that investments are local. So these are the three things that I think we should have a look at and see what we can do. Now, to finish my, my intervention, and I hope I did not submerge you too much with figures and data, um, it's of course, we should find a gestalt approach, as I say, we should, it's everything together. It's not only about money, it's about the mindset, it's about awareness, it's about creating space to, to risk-taking, and I saw some good examples in the best practice you showed. So you have to have the global picture of what you should do to have a scale-up environment, and I would finish by using Machiavelli, who says, OK, it's an obstacle. Let's use it together as an opportunity. I think we have now a momentum to do something for the scale-ups. And I really hope and count on the region because you're, you're crucial for that. So thank you very much. If you want to read more about it, let me make some publicity of my last book about entrepreneurship. So it's, a, it's an easy to read book about scale-up and how to do it. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, for your attention. And if there are questions, of course, if there's time, I'm still open. Thank you, Rudy. That was a very interesting presentation that you have given. And it was also really um, interesting because um, later on, we will be showing um, a video about the study that the project has made. And you have mentioned some factors affecting the scale-up of SMEs. Um, and these factors are also reflected in the study that um, we have made. And so while the audience are thinking about their questions and digesting um, what you have presented, um, Maybe um, I could ask um, a small question about um, what you mentioned earlier. You said that the funds um, in, in Europe are small and investments are made outside Europe. Maybe you have um, briefly answered this, but could you um, maybe elaborate more on why this is the case? Well, I, I think if we speak it from a purely economic point of view, forget about emotions and philosophy, and what happens, a fund invests where the return is. And I showed you in one of my, my slides, um, the there's a recording problem apparently. What I showed you in one of my slides is that the, the return today to invest in American economy is higher than the European economy. So if this is the case, of course, the companies goes where they have return. And so even VCs in Europe, if they see that they can make more money transatlantic, they will not take care about political considerations. They will say the return is there, so we go there. So the one thing I find, our funds are small, and on top of that, the portion of our funds that is investing outside Europe is bigger. So we lose twice. So what we have to do, first, we have to make our funds bigger, like for instance, the S-Cloud program. But the second thing we have to do is to make that our investees are attractive, that they make return, that they have the mindset of scale up. Eh? And you see in the best practices to incubators, accelerators, you have to use those things to show that you should put, as a VC, your money into European companies. And I would say, if I go within Europe, as I showed, it's Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, where today you can make money. So my point is, let's think politically how we can do that. All right. Um, thank you, Rudy. Do we have any other questions from the audience or comments about what um, about the information shared? If not, oh. Stefan, did you want to yes. say something? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Rudy, uh, for your presentation and sharing thoughts. Uh, I would totally agree. So when we see our startups, um, they, they lack of the same problems. And I think the conclusion that you give uh, is, is, uh, sounds very promising for me. So uh, to have a systematic, um, holistic value chain for startups. And of course, we're starting in the beginning with uh, all these ideation and mindset things. And I think one way is we need a more European mindset, especially in the end for, for, for go-to-market strategies within Europe. 
Uh, I don't think it's not only a problem regarding um, finance, but also market regulations. Um, it's, it's very segmented um, compared to a big US market for for our startups, it's easy to go while jump accelerator to, to the United States and with so you have a very huge market and I think we'll, we need to develop this further on. <clears throat> so uh, I would totally uh, yeah, like to see this <laughs> uh, startups to you. I find it very interesting what you said, Stefan, because I, I thought exactly the same thing. At the moment, we have... 2014-2018, uh, we've seen that 45% of our successful scale-ups left Europe. No. So I said, why? I think, like you, the market to the money. So we asked a consultant, Roland Berger, to make a, to make a study on that. And the conclusion was for me quite fascinating. 5% left Europe due for money reasons. And what happened, in fact, if I find money in, in battery ventures or uh, Palo Alto ventures, the guys, the American says, no problem, we can pay you, but you should move your headquarters to us. And once you move your headquarters, you move everything. And so we've done a study with, with the University of Ghent, because I'm a professor at the University of Ghent as well, we did a very interesting study, which perhaps we should re reactualize with COVID now. But this study showed that the mobility is not the money, it's the company. Which, because your spoke, and I think it was uh, Esteban who spoke about, uh, and Rafael about the importance of digitalization. But the digital company, it's not like a petro company, a eh? petrochemic company, which you, it's easy to move. A digital company, tuck, it's moved. Eh? So if your guy in the United States and Palo Alto says, I will put money in your company if you move, it takes one time. And I think we, we'll all have pro we all have examples in our mind of Spanish companies, French companies, Criteo, for instance, uh, um, uh, the, uh, all those companies they just left they just left because the money is there and if you say I need look at Skype European company by the way Skype was looking for 125 million tell me where can you find in Europe today even 125 million so they find it uh, transatlantic and they left and that's a, an example which is almost 45% of the companies so we put our effort by incubators accelerators startup financing and then once the guys are really good and they make money and they have the IPR and they create employment, they say bye-bye. This is not a good policy option, of course. So I count on you guys to, to change that. Definitely a call to action to our regional development um, practitioners with, with us this morning. Um, thank you, Rudy. Um, and if our um, audience have any further questions, maybe they can ask it in the chat and then you can also answer there. Thank you very much. Um, so now we move on to the next portion of our event, um, the Scale Up Project Journey. A teaser that we will be showing you a video about the study that um, the project consortium has done. And so over the past few months, um, we have preparing this study that compares the factors affecting the economic development of SMEs in Europe, and in particular, the regions involved in the scale-up project. Um, so the time frame used was pre-COVID from 2018 to 2019 and during COVID from 2020 to 2021. So we are pleased to share the results of the study with you through this video, which my colleague Giacomo will be sharing right now. The Interreg Europe Scale-Up Project has been on a mission to improve policy instruments in its partner regions to help SMEs grow and internationalise. From 2018 to 2019, the factors affecting the scale-up of SMEs were globalisation, with more than 80% of European exporters being SMEs, while innovation has been a key factor in increasing productivity and scaling growth. On the other hand, SMEs face difficulties to access external financing and due to better resources, highly skilled employees prefer large enterprises over SMEs. From 2020 to 2021, the scale-up factors shifted to digitalization, with COVID-19 widening the gap between traditional offline and digital business models. It also became evident that governments needed to pay attention to the growth of SMEs that survive in the recovering economy, moving toward more structural policies. These are the SME support measures implemented by the scale-up regions before and during the pandemic. 
Pre-COVID, Murcia focused more on financial assistance, innovation and digitalization programs to help SMEs scale up. During the pandemic, SME support measures shifted toward financial assistance and innovation programs. In Hessen, pre-COVID SME support focused on innovation and digitalization programs. With the pandemic, they prioritized more their financial assistance and digitalization programs to support SMEs. Attica highlighted the importance of innovation, digitalization, investment and financial assistance programs for SMEs pre-COVID, but during the pandemic, they prioritized financial assistance programs. On the other hand, Lazio focused their efforts on innovation and globalization programs pre-pandemic, which shifted to digital transformation support and financial assistance programs during the pandemic. In Lubelski, financial assistance was the main tool used to support SMEs pre-pandemic. With COVID hitting the region, they focused as well on digitalization programs. Nottingham supported SMEs through financial assistance and innovation programs, along with scale-up services and coordinated business support. With COVID, they focused more on financial assistance and innovation programs. To aid small business owners in the context of COVID-19, our findings suggest the following to help SMEs scale up. Provide tax rate exemptions. Adjust policies for existing SME debt like extending loan terms and reducing instalment payments. Develop a regulatory framework to close the digitalization gap and apply technologies to improve the efficiency of government administrative systems. Establish an e-center to provide free courses and events for entrepreneurs. Redeploy non-utilized workforce to aid in crisis activities. Expand remote learning and reskilling initiatives and invest into remote working which will probably become the new norm for the foreseeable future. The data presented in this video is the result of research carried out by the Interreg Europe Scale-Up project. Click the link in the description to read the full study. All right, we hope you enjoyed the video. I am pasting in the chat where you can read more about the study. Um, so to moving on, um, to talk about the, the scale-up journey of the region of Murcia, welcome back to the screen, um, Rafael Atas. Hello, Ivana. Dear audience, for your attendance today, um, I have the honor to uh, express uh, taking a look through the window of Scala project into the good practices developed in the other public regions and how we have got inspiration from uh, a variety of them in order to get them transfer somehow to our uh, regional environment, business environment. Um, Uh, we have been working over the last programming period, 
With this in mind, uh, we have uh, uh, received support from uh, the uh, Regional uh, Stakeholders Action Group of the Scala project, which is integrated by the uh, European business uh, centers in the Muthi region, with the Confederation of uh, Business Organizations in the Muthi region, the two public universities, and the Association of Local Development Agents in the, the, all the municipalities in the Muthi region. With that sort of uh, support substructure from, 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 we have taken a look through the uh, wind to different uh, from Hessen. But we have put the emphasis on the uh, Nottingham uh, best practices, which came uh, uh, to us uh, through the D2N2 uh, initiative coordinated by the uh, project partners in Nottingham. Uh, we were also assisted by the Nottingham Trent uh, University and uh, the East Midland Chambers of Commerce. And we got inspiration for an uh, uh, upscale uh, practice, which uh, integrates at the same time uh, the uh, um, training and mentoring uh, support for uh, SMEs. With this uh, inspiration, we have developed a concept note, uh, which was uh, moved upstairs to the uh, indirect program for approval, and we have received that. And we will set up a training program uh, with, uh, with a mentoring component as well, in order to allow the business uh, participants to continue growing uh, in, on a continuous matter, on a continuous way, in order to, 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 to explore new possibilities of companies to, to uh, uh, reinforce the access to market. We have uh, created uh, three uh, scales of eligibility for companies that can join uh, into this uh, uh, training and mentoring program with a, div a different level of intensity according to the, uh, the nature of the companies, as you can see in the slide. But uh, the training component was very much designed in order to tackle uh, all the priorities uh, in the uh, digitalization market at the moment. Uh, after COVID, Com training components uh, uh, dealing with uh, growth roadmaps, uh, human resources development, strategic uh, scaling management team, scaling performance management and financial management, uh, marketing, strategic marketing, and so on, will, will be the core of this training component. Uh, this training component will be held uh, in the first semester of 22 in the springtime. So uh, in 23, 24 and 25, this uh, training component will be replicated again and again in order to uh, make it sustainable in time. Foreseen the participation of 10 companies per year uh, will come in some three people, three individuals per company in this training component. So. Uh, the company developed and, and deployed by experts uh, in 24 hours of training, plus of specific and reputed mentoring of consultants uh, helping the, assist the enterprise to go beyond the, the, the training company. So the companies will be working for three months in a global calendar, as the one that you can see in front of you in, in the slide No. Not, not willing to go in deep details on that, but just to mention that we have uh, made use of uh, the financial contribution of regional development fund for the Muthi region uh, in the period 2014-2020, and it will be a similar support that will be granted for the period. As our coach at the science park um, uh, at the University of Kassel. Uh, unfortunately, as we are sick, so I will try to, to do my best and present uh, the thought and action plan of Northern Hess, the region here.
uh, where we live. So first of all, we uh, are in the center of Germany. Um, we have a region of with roughly 1 million inhabitants. Uh, we have one big university. So there's located also the camp of Jumeurs at IHK, the regional management, and uh, I'm, I'm working at Science Park. So regarding the points that also Rudy said in the beginning, there we have many things established already regarding the startup to scale up uh, track. So we have many things uh, ranging from um, scholarships from the university, ID competitions, business plan competitions, and so on to, um, uh, until scaling up funding, crowdfunding. So a whole lot of, of instruments and a regional accelerator and investment uh, club as well. On the other side, we have the problem and challenge to um, make the SMEs of the regions future-proof. Um, there are many companies working also in the manufacturing fields, and they have the challenge to cope with the, with the disruptive technologies and the dynamic of the uh, megatrends that they are facing. And here, between these two tracks, of course, we see a great um, opportunity to do something. And uh, we chose um, the... SME as a, as a startup starting point for this. <clears throat> so what we did together um, with our stakeholders uh, was uh, to, to run a SWOT analysis. We made local co-creation events and we talked and discussed many things too. We had the learning uh, events and format between the scale-up partners. We exchanged good and best practice and so on. And we conducted also surveys within these. I was also involved with all uh, within these uh, process and. Um, overall, we try to establish a learning process to enable innovation transformation and to find the detect the opportunity for the next big project somehow. Uh, within this project, we just um, thought of here you know, some impressions of these things. <laughs> within this project, uh, we uh, found the spot for two small smaller projects and they will be um, described in the action plan. So one of the project, um, um, was oriented at um, the Open Innovation Challenge best practice from last year Nova. And the other one was a bit uh, included um, after the example from the Upscaler project of Nottingham. <clears throat> so uh, in general, we, we try to do three actions that incorporates two best practice. The third one I'll explain later. Um, the aim of the action plan is to focus special needs and growth of SMEs from the industrial sector. As we said, it's more this uh, transformative approach, but where also startups can arise as, in, as gate ups in, as well. Um, the approach is to have a cross-sectoral or cross-innovation approach and strategy development for international knowledge exchange and innovation management. Um, we will try to increase the ability of regional industries to develop a new process of product innovation, thus being able to react to the fast-changing market. So this is somehow the um, Challenge depicted. The operational program chosen is RTF. <clears throat> um, and um, the indicator, main indicator there is the number of SMEs from the industrial sector which have started new projects to increase innovation capabilities for scaling up. So we try to meet this point by um, connecting it with a pro project called Move IT. <clears throat> uh, and this is an approach where um, the, star, uh, the, the SMEs of the clusters that are already, already exist um, go into a fruitful collaboration with the IT cluster that was recently developed uh, because we think that digitalization is a, is a big transformer and transformative force. And um, to foster this cross-sectional cooperation of SMEs within the framework of a strategy form for the development of new business fields, we have set up this project. It's not directly the um, adaptation of the accelerator of uh, Nottingham, but we will try, or as Astrid said, we will try to um, include many of the elements that were described there, also the, the coaching and acceleration phase, for example. The second action plan is um, an adaptation of the um, <clears throat> Open Innovation Challenge from Musnia. So it's about identifying challenges um, to um, generate teams uh, and to find solutions for these challenges for SMEs and to uh, detect new business opportunities and to, to bring them into um, yeah, societal applications <clears throat> very quickly. Yeah, the outlook is um, the third thing that we, what we found out um, 
there was a, a very nice cooperation in football between our stakeholders. Um, and we thought of continuing this uh, fruitful interaction um, in, a, in a positive way that may lead to better um, proposals in the future, better projects or more promising projects, more or less uh, with, a, with a cooperative approach. Sometimes, as I said yesterday, more between the lines, it's, it's a bit difficult um, to bring everybody on board and to have the, the, good, the, the best mindsets uh, aligned um, on, the, on the best goals and so on. So we're working on that. This is, uh, seems to be promising to um, yeah, enhance the collaboration a bit more. Yes, and as Astrid also like to say uh, that she really loved the interaction um, with, with you uh, from, from the EU projects and to um, develop new project proposals on an EU level um, and um, align to the, to the proposed systematic scheme um, that Rudy presented just. I think there are many things that we can work on cons consequently um, for enhancing the SMA. Um, things. So if any questions, feel free to contact us. Um, maybe one thing is just if, if you, in, the, in your introductory talk, you said maybe what are the wishes or demands um, for if we had something like uh, a mix of climate kick and and uh, European enterprise network on a regional level with, with uh, adequate funding, then we could bring things uh, really into, into a good rolling. Uh, so thank you for your attention and we are open, open for questions. Thank you, Stefan. Um, so yes, if there are any questions for Stefan or for Rafa, please put them in the chat and then um, hopefully um, we'll be able to answer them later on. Um, but moving on, um, to tell us more about the Greek scale-up experience, let us welcome to the screen Mr. Costas Karamarcos, a strategic planner on behalf of the RDFA. Costas, the screen is yours. Uh, good morning to all. Uh... I hope you can see my uh, presentation here. Ivana, is it visible? It's okay. Yes, we can. Yes, okay. So um, what we are trying to do in uh, Attic Athens, and I suppose in most of the other partners' regions, is to, to get the face out of the jar and uh, move into a bigger one that we could be freely developed. So our main goal... Uh, um, speaking on behalf of the, the Greek partner, is to support enterprises to better scale up, uh, especially in the near future, uh, with funds coming from the Atticus Regional Operational Program. So uh, this is the logo of our partner that is hosting the Innovation Center uh, of Attica Region, funded by the Operational Program, that is a very close contact uh, almost daily with organizations in uh, Athens and uh, uh, the whole region to collect the, um, all of the recent needs of uh, the enterprises as they're included in the smart specialization uh, strategy uh, plan. And um, uh, for that, uh, we'll also give you some highlights about the activities of the partner that is managing the credits of the public investment uh, uh, program. These are the main activities. It is also financing uh, in regard to regional, regional and special development programs. And finally, uh, the main activity is the technical support of the region in the conduct uh, neither of studies or research, cash management, and of course, participations, uh, participation in European Union uh, programs. Uh, regional Development Fund's main priority is to support enterprises startups and young scientists to scale up. So, uh, of course, it is always um, a daily uh, effort to try and find new resources, uh, beside the one coming from the uh, regional level, from the operational program, also to fund additional activities for businesses uh, scale up support, especially through the Innovation Center. Those two years were crazy, uh, changed everything regarding entrepreneurship scaling up efforts. We heard yesterday in our internal meeting that most of the partners uh, used their budget from the operational programs to support financially uh, for operational needs, the SMEs. So uh, I would like to give you some 
critical numbers about Attica to understand how critical it is for the economy of the full country. Since uh, uh, Attica counted in almost 50% last year of the national GDP, same year the region employed almost 38% of the country's workforce. And finally, the services sector dominates the regional economy and accounts for 88% of the region as GV, of the regional GVA. So services, as you can see, is of the highest uh, uh, number. So how did scale up supported our efforts? What have we learned more that we didn't know before the project and why we are, uh, let's say, using or uh, using Enderic Europe program for our uh, needs to support SMEs? First of all, there is a comment here about the smart specialization strategy in Greece that it uh, lags behind in innovation development. As you can see, based on the Innovation Union score, scoreboard of 2020, uh, Greece holds uh, the 19th position in the relevant charts among the 27 European uh, Union uh, members. Uh, our uh, strategy, our smart, smart specialization strategy, aims to enhance, uh, enhance uh, uh, innovation activity in three critical areas, creative, blue, and need-based sustainable uh, economies. And what we did through this project is exchanging experience with all of the partners, uh, regional ecosystems to improve our performance. This was our main task through uh, this project to improve our perf performance with uh, uh, possible new tools. What we mainly uh, did in Attica in Greece, we followed carefully all the good practices, uh, the positive and negative results that came out of them based on the descriptions and the meetings we, have, uh, we had with the partners. We followed a very, very structured peer review methodology to focus and evaluate two of them that uh, had a very big good practice transfer potential. And of course, we worked in parallel to improve the capacity building of the personnel that was involved in the project coming not only from the partner staff, from the partner staff but also from the main uh, or the core stakeholders that were involved in the project. We also motivate them I'm referring to the critical stakeholders to provide us during the project lifetime feedback and ideas on the policy topic. And of course, we were in very close contact with the rector and the managing authority staff of the Attica Rope that was our policy instrument. So we also used uh, SWOT analysis as a critical supporting tool to, uh, to start up from the state of the art uh, on the uh, selected policy instrument, and of course, during the exchange of experience uh, phase of the project. All these kind of uh, uh, tools that um, filled our uh, project basket to work on the action plan that is the final outcome, the final deliverable, the most critical one. Uh, we had one uh, critical bilateral study visit to uh, our colleagues in Hessen, and we learned we had the deep dives in the Movine Innovation Lab strategic networking to increase R&D projects and patent applications in Northern Hessen. Uh, this uh, good practice has a real strong positive transfer potential for our region, as, as we say, it fits better to the Greek entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystem and culture. Of course, this... Um, uh, good practice, uh, it is directly connected to our selected uh, policy instrument. And finally, we prepared and already approved by JS a very, very well structured, as we believe, action plan to be implemented already early in 2022. The main idea is to give you a, a very brief description is to connect the research community to, uh, to industry by guiding the best ideas of the research community from the lab to the market, as we uh, say uh, uh, in this kind of projects. The aim, the main aim is to develop research-based products or services that could be incubated in existing or new companies, mostly spin-offs. 
So the results expected to finalize my presentation is that this project uh, we elaborated is called the National Kapodistria University Athens Investor of the Year, that it aims in promoting technology transfer among researchers, accelerating the process from lab to market and creating entrepreneurial awareness. So it is a useful tool to keep us in close contact with other regions and do more uh, as we have to do in supporting scaling up businesses. Now at the uh, end of phase one, I believe that we have a very strong uh, project network that is here with uh, the colleagues from the other regions also for uh, any uh, possible future achievements. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you, Costas, for sharing um, Atlika's action plan and your scale-up journey. Um, so now to share their scale-up journey and actions, let us welcome Mr. Stefano Grancini from the European Projects Office and Enterprise Europe Network Desk of Lazio Innova. So good morning to everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, if you could put your presentation in full screen. Okay, can you see it now? Yes, perfect. So in my presentation, I will sh shortly explain uh, the structure of our uh, action plan and some ideas that we have to exploit the results of the project of scale up after the end uh, of the project. So uh, regarding the action plan, the policy instrument that we have selected is the axis three competitiveness of the 2014-2020 uh, uh, ERDF regional operative uh, uh, program. And uh, in, in details, we will try to uh, improve and innovate the project called Lazio Open Innovation Center of Zagarola that is financed by the Action 351 Subaction A of the Access 3 of the uh, Regional Operative Program. So, in details, this uh, uh, Action 351 uh, Subaction uh, A aims at reforming uh, the uh, incubator, aim at transforming the incubators, so the, the network of incubators managed by uh, in uh, uh, a network of places uh, that allow the access uh, to regional service uh, at uh, um, transforming the network of incubators in, in a network of uh, so-called active spaces. Uh, with a, a central hub in Rome and uh, a, a certain number of uh, spokes uh, uh, widespread uh, uh, around Lazio region. So as the active spaces or innovation hub is, is a place that can be virtual or physical that offers uh, a, a wide range of services uh, for the creation and development of businesses, much wider than a single and simple uh, incubator. So these services that these innovation hubs, this network of innovation hubs uh, uh, can offer uh, are co-working spaces, contamination labs, for incubation, incubation training, tutoring, mentorship, uh, information on EU national and regional calls, uh, they offer spaces and facility for startups access to, to, to networks, to research infrastructure, to laboratories, and also uh, funds uh, access uh, funds for pre-start and seed uh, and seed capital. So, um, what has happened in in these years? In 2015, Lazio region. Uh, adopted the first administrative act to, to, to start this project called Spaziativo Network. And 10 active spaces, Innovation Hub, have been created um, and now are working in, in the region. So in 2016, have been activated the uh, Innovation Hub of Zagarolo. And in 2017, uh, the region uh, adopted the, the administrative act to start this uh, specific project in Zagarolo called Lazio Open Innovation Center. That is financed um, 
by the, the, the access tree of the regional operative uh, program. Um, so um, we will try to uh, improve this, this project through the best practice in COVA. That is an open innovation challenge that works in this way. So there is a, a selection of small and medium enterprises that request innovation. There is a selection of graduate researcher and former entrepreneurs that offer innovation. Uh, there is the creation of, uh, of teams composed by uh, graduate researcher and entrepreneurs that offer innovation, but they, that uh, also want to uh, become a company, new startup. These teams are included uh, in the pre-incubation uh, process and in the product service um, prototyping part. So they elaborate the, the prototype uh, and then the, the, the uh, prototype elaborated by team is uh, approved and validated by the small and medium enterprises. So concretely, uh, what specific activity uh, do we want to, to improve through INCOVA best practice? A specific activity called micro-innovation laboratories. Uh, how, does, uh, how do these uh, micro-innovation laboratories work now? So we, we select small and medium enterprises requesting innovation, and then we select very, very small micro-enterprises that will have to offer innovation. These micro-enterprises are inserted into the product service prototype prototyping part. They elaborate a prototypes, uh, uh, and then these prototypes are um, validated by the small and medium enterprises. So how uh, shall we try to improve, to innovate this process? Inserting some aspect of uh, INCOVA uh, best practices. This aspect, in innovative aspect, are those in, in red. So this is uh, the description of the new uh, micro-innovation laboratories uh, um, that will include some element of INCOVA. So how will be the, the new process? There, is, there will be a selection uh, of small and medium enterprises uh, and of micro enterprises as it is now, but we will select also graduates, researchers, and former entrepreneurs offering in, in, in innovation. That is something that we are not doing now. There will be the creation of teams, and these teams uh, that uh, aim at becoming a, a startup will be inserted in the go-to-market process and in the uh, prototyping path. And also, these are aspects that we uh, don't do now. So, also the the the, uh, the micro enterprises will be inserted in the product service prototyping path, and uh, the the micro enterprise and the teams will elaborate the prototypes and the small and medium enterprises will validate the, 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 the prototypes. The, the small and medium enterprise will validate the prototypes uh, elaborated by micro enterprises and by teams. So in red, as you can see, are uh, underlined the, the innovative aspect taken from, uh, from Incova. So another innovation uh, regards the go-to-market process. Now, um, the we are managing go-to-market process and they are also open to teams, but not uh, to teams coming from a micro innovation laboratories. So this is the first innovation. The second innovation is that our idea is to create a second go-to-market um, path upgraded of higher quality dedicated only to teams coming from the micro innovation laboratories. So these are the uh, innovative aspects that we want to introduce, uh, uh, taking in cover as, uh, as best practice, uh, as reference best practices. So this is regarding the action plan, but we uh, have some ideas uh, uh, also about how to exploit the results of the project uh, once uh, um, the scale up will be will be finished, and uh, we are uh, thinking about how we could, in some way, improve the, the next uh, regional operative program. Mm, so the 2021-2027 ERDF regional operative program, exploiting some best practices uh, coming from the project. So, uh, as you know, these are the uh, policy uh, objective of next program in period. 
And the, the most interesting for scale up is the, the first and more competitive and smarter Europe that is composed by these uh, strategic, uh, strategic goals. Uh, so, um, regarding the best practices, uh, we have uh, uh, analyzed during the project all the best practices of the partner. We, we made a qualitative analysis based on criteria like relevancy, transferability, and effectiveness, and we elaborated a, a, sh a short list of four best practices. Um, as you can see, then we have selected INCOVA, for the action plan, but we think that uh, for the next uh, uh, regional operative program, also uh, an NTU employability upscaler and egg platform, egg scale up platform could be useful to uh, try to, to improve the, the next uh, uh, regional priority program financed by um, ERDF. So, uh, no um, complete draft of the next regional priority program has been elaborated so far, but uh, what we have done uh, as Lazio region, uh, we have elaborated the first hypothesis of specific intervention that could be financed with, uh, um, with the next uh, regional operative program. So we have analyzed only those uh, of the um, pol policy objective one, because it is the most interesting for scale up. We have analyzed all these specific intervention and we uh, uh, understood that uh, mm, the most interesting are those linked to the specific goals one, and specific goal three. So what have we done? We have done a sort of matrix. So now I, I will not go into details, but in this matrix, we have on the left, all the uh, specific interventions and on the right, uh, the best practices coming from uh, scale up that could be potentially uh, improve uh, um, um the, the the specific uh, intervention so these are the specific intervention of uh, specific goal uh, one and for example the first one could be improved by the best practice upscaler and egg scale up platform the second one could be uh, adopt some uh, specific aspect of all the of all the, the the best practices, and we 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 have done the same for the sec for the third strategic goals for every specific intervention connected to these uh, strategic goals. We have linked, we have selected the best practices that could in some way uh, improve this specific uh, intervention. So this is the uh, idea uh, about how exploding the, the, the best practice coming from the project in the next uh, uh, regional operative uh, program. So I have finished, thank you very much. Thank you, Stefano. Um, now to share the scale up journey of the region of Lublin in Poland, let us welcome Olga Dubrowska from the Investors and Exporters Assistance Center at the Marshall Office of the Lubelski region. Hi, everybody. I will start to share my screen. I would like you to take you to take all of you out of the on the scale up journey of the basket for your wood chip within the scale up project. Uh, I will present to you the way which lead us uh, to the action plan. So the first uh, time when we had a chance to meet our partners was at kickoff meeting in Murcia. Uh, it was a two days meeting uh, uh, in July, 2019. And uh, we had the possibility to introduce uh, ourselves to the project consortium. And also during the second day of the uh, meeting, the whole consortium discussed and agreed on methodology and communication strategies, uh, which will be used uh, until the end of the project. And also, uh, I will just briefly say a few words about Lubelskie. Lubelskie is situated in East Central Poland, and uh, we, our leading sectors are wood and furniture, ag agriculture, mostly food processing, logistics, uh, machine automotive, 
and aviation, chemical and VPO. And also uh, Lubelskia is um, um, the leading region when it comes to agriculture and fat food industry employs 20% uh, of uh, the region population. Uh, after the kickoff meeting, we organized the launching conference in Lubelskia. It was in October 2019. And during this uh, conference, we had a chance to uh, discuss topics such as financing, uh, tools and business development support models, foreign expansion strategy and modern businesses scaling instruments uh, were also discussed during the conference. And also uh, during this conference, we uh, invited to participate in a regional stakeholder group uh, and we created a stakeholder group, group after this uh, meeting. And the first uh, regional stakeholder group uh, uh, was in November 2019, and we discussed uh, what are the needs of uh, the Poyobotship and what we can expect uh, from our, what st stakeholder expects, ex expects us uh, to do. Uh, and we had a chance uh, to host all of the um, project partners uh, during the interregional meeting in Dublin. We were the only um, partner which has uh, that kind of opportunity. And we were, we are really thankful that we had a chance to uh, show all of the partners our uh, region a little bit. And uh, the meeting was uh, divided into two parts. And uh, the first part was uh, devoted to the presentation of three, three best practices selected by the Lubelskia. And uh, we presented uh, uh, best practice, which was Investors and Exporters Assistance Center and Lab Lubelskia Nevada Acceleration Bridge and Regional Brand Lubelskia. And the second part of the meeting was uh, related to the topics uh, of the concentrations of concentration of businesses. And also uh, we, we um, organized uh, two study visits. Uh, the first study visit was uh, hosted by Perua, is a like local brewery. Uh, and also we were visiting a project company from uh, Okshuf is a small town in Lubelskia, which produces devices for testing di diagnostic equipment using medicine. So here we have some uh, pictures from this meeting. Uh, you can see some of uh, people which are today at the meeting at the pictures, if you look closely to them. <laughs> and. Unfortunately, I say thanks to COVID, uh, we have to um, we have to had to take a series of online study visits, uh, which were carried out on the basis of a methodology specially prepared at the partnership level. Rafa mentioned it before uh, the methodology. It was really helpful that we had that kind of methodology um, designed, especially uh, for the kind of uh, meetings and we had a chance to visit all of the partners online which was also really fruitful i would say and also thanks to COVID, uh, we took part in three per review meetings about three pre-selected best practices um these uh, best practices were moving uh NTU and employability and open innovation challenge uh, all of the peer review meetings were also uh, online. After we took part in those peer review meetings, uh, we decided to implement moving uh, best practice. And that, that was the time when we started uh, preparation of our <coughs> regional action plan. <clears throat> uh, moving uh, turned out to be the most suitable uh, practice for Lubelskia. Uh, and it was like a, uh, the, the easiest uh, way for us to implement uh, there was this practice. And I will uh, say more about it. Uh, the lessons we learned from Moving Innovation Lab program, which is operated by the regional management, management Northern Hessen, uh, this uh, best practice gives uh, members 
opportunity to have their innovations evaluated and presented to a professional selected panel of experts. And that was something we were look, looking closely to and we wanted to uh, use uh, something similar in our uh, uh, action plan and in our um, uh, actions. Uh, and what was uh, the most essential for us in the Moving Innovation Lab? Uh, the effective example of working cooperation between specialists from universities and SMEs, uh, which were facilitated by a hosting body in, when it comes to Lubelskia, we are the, the Marshall Office uh, is the hosting body. Uh, and different way of cooperation between science and business, easy to implement in the region, and a comprehensive set of tools. Um, and how we adapt this uh, best practice, uh, the moving solution, we uh, were at the, uh, at the uh, testing stage of uh, the tool uh, which we call technological pilot. And we, are, we were looking for some uh, good practices which will help, help us turn it into the uh, working stage, uh, this technological pilot. And uh, technological pilot aims to uh, provide a support to SMEs by involving experts. And we were facing some barriers uh, when it comes to recruiting the experts in New Belgium. Uh, uh, the obvious uh, solution uh, for uh, to, to, uh, to overcome those barriers would be a financial incentive to for ex experts uh, just to pay them money. Uh, but uh, the uncertainty of financing uh, uh, it was it wasn't uh, that um, easy to implement and uh, the. Uh, moving uh, idea was like uh, something we really would like to use and uh, without experts this program wouldn't be working so uh, at the same time uh, there are some changes in the Polish education educational law which uh, give universities points for uh, contribution on uh, social economic environment and uh, Experts uh, taking part in technological pilot will will be um, awarded with those uh, points. So uh, moving, uh, uh, so our um, technological pilot is moving based, but we have to change a little bit uh, uh, to be able to uh, tailor this uh, best practice to local circumstances. Uh, and when it comes to time frame and uh, the preparation stage, uh, our deadline was uh, by September, but uh, our action plan was uh, ready a little bit earlier. Uh, we, we didn't uh, wanted to wait uh, that long and we get the green light from the Joint Secretariat and also from our, our board of uh, board. Uh, uh, at the region, so uh, we started uh, with the creation of the draft letter of intent as well, which we would like to uh, uh, sign with universities. And uh, uh, right now we are at the invitation stage and we already had four meetings with the university representatives and now we are going to meet one more university. And uh, also we sent uh, the uh, draft uh, version of letter of intent to those universities we already visited. And our um, main goal for this stage is to sign five letters of intent with uh, those five universities. And also uh, the next part, it will be the uh, implementation stage, which will take place uh, starting December this year and will last one year. And we will we are going to test to test this new functionalities of the technolo technological pilot, and also uh, 
do the dissemination of the technology as a tool to support entrepreneurs and educate process. And the milestone will be the improved technological pilot with the use of elements from moving uh, good practice. Uh, yeah, this is the place where we are now. And when it comes to monitoring stage, uh, we will be tracking the success rate, the implementation of solution developed as part of the technological pilot and tracking dissemination of information of entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, when it comes to uh, costs uh, and organization, evaluation and reimbursement of the university experts is on the side of universities because the universities when uh, to get the points, they need to apply uh, for the to the ministry uh, and give the proof of uh, the social economical change. And this is for, from our side. The uh, Marshall Office will give uh, that kind of letter. So it will uh, say that uh, this social economical change was made uh, and uh, orga organ. And uh, when it comes to financing, uh, te technological pilot has its own financing. So uh, we don't need any uh, future expenditures on that project. And oh, we oh, are- there you have one minute left. Okay, thank you. And we, so I, I would like to just add that we are uh, looking forward uh, to the next stages of the project. And we are hope that uh, the future is bright. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Olga, for sharing um, the Lubelski um, experience and your action plan. Um, so now to tell us more about the scale-up journey of Nottingham in the UK, we have um, Chris Book, who is a specialist in supporting business growth, economic research, and strategy development, um, currently leading the D2N2 Growth Hub team to support aspirational local businesses to grow. Chris, the screen is yours. Thank you, Ivana, and good morning, everybody. I should just try and... Sorry, Ivana, can I confirm you see that? Sorry, Olga, can you mute your microphone, please? Yes. Thank you so much. Okay, right. Uh, hopefully, you can see the slides. So, um, yeah, a quick um, scan through our scale up journey in Nottingham. Um, I should talk about the uh, situation before we started the scale up project, uh, the current scale up provision that we have now, and uh, some information about our scale up action plan, which we've developed as part of this project and a little uh, uh, mention to the future as well. So um, yeah, I'm based at Nottingham City Council. Uh, so representing Not Nottingham as the partner in this project. Um, but my role also covers uh, the wider geography of Derby, Derbyshire, Nottingham and Nottinghamshire, which is otherwise known as D2 and 2 So um, before, the scale project commenced. Uh, we started really the first uh, dedicated support for scale ups in our region in 2017 with the upscaler project. There was an upscaler pilot followed by the, the upscaler project, which you all know a lot about now. And it's really great that that's been picked up in, in other regions and elements of that have been taken on by, by, your, by you in your, in your regions. So as you know, that was around supporting ambitious businesses as well as uh, genuine uh, existing scale-ups right through that spectrum, uh, focusing on diagnostics, on workshops, and particularly around leadership support. It also offered peer networking opportunities uh, and access to talent, access to graduates, as well as some grant funding to help with that. Um, and at the time, uh, the UK Scale Up Institute um, had identified the fact that access to UK markets and access to talent were the top priorities 
the top bar- barriers sorry, for, um, for scale-ups. Uh, leadership, uh, access to infrastructure and access to finance were also really key elements at that time. So I won't dwell too much on, on the success of Upscaler, but it's worth mentioning and this um, information on the, on the left side of the screen was presented by Rafa earlier on one of his slides. Uh, but the project supported out, um, 248 SMEs, uh, issued £160,000 worth of grant funding uh, and was very well received in the area. So great success. And as I said, quite an even split between the stages of SMEs that it was able to support. So right from breakthrough, startup, growing companies, through to ambitious companies, potential scale-ups and genuine scale-ups as well. Um, in Just to give a bit of context, the, the, the latest national scale-up review that was done this year uh, by the scale-up Institute showed that their, the growth of scale-ups across the country had slowed somewhat. Uh, so in, in our region, if you, if you can see on the right-hand side, um, between 2013 and 2018, we had a 1.5% growth, and that uh, slowed slightly um, incorporate 2019 uh, down to 1.1%. In, in Nottingham ourselves, we've remained pretty much stable in terms of numbers, but clearly COVID has, has had an impact on that. So we'll, it remains to be seen how that pans out. In terms of the, 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 um, the growth that we have had in our region, um, that's been around companies involved in finance, insurance, uh, manufacturing sector, and also admin and support services, which are a really, really key uh, element. Um, the, the key needs for scale-ups are still being shown as uh, being around access to markets and also skills and leadership skills, um, which we've heard about already today. So uh, the specifics around leaderships have been identified as strategy development, sales, business development and brand building. So that those core elements that Upscaler delivered still remain very, very relevant, I believe, um, today. The interesting um, aspect from our perspective, and I'll come on to our action plan because we're looking at equity, um, supporting equity into SMEs. Important element of the review that was done this year is the awareness of equity finance has improved within the country so that that's a positive thing i think because it's a really good opportunity to support smes in that regard so moving on to our current scale-up provision and um, we've we've now got the digital upscaler project so very much on the upscaler model, but focused on digital uh, this was envisioned before covid actually but it now becomes extremely relevant as we know digitization is is coming to the fore even more, and businesses are really, really um, benefiting from focusing on that element of their business, and particularly with, with regard to scaling up. So the Digital Upscale um, project uh, delivered by colleagues at uh, East Midlands Chamber, um, really focusing on helping businesses to introduce emerging technology um, and utilise that to, to help them grow. Um, there's, there's grants involved in this as well, um, and all sorts of, of wider, quite in-depth, one-to-one uh, support for the business to take them to the next level in, ter- in terms of their digital strategy. Uh, we also have um, Innovate UK Edge service, which is a national resource supporting innovative SMEs from any sector. Uh, and helping them to grow. So we have a dedicate, dedicated advisor team locally uh, to help with that and all, um, all the aspects that are on the screen there are covered. Just uh, on this slide, so bringing out some of the key initiatives that can be accessed through that service. So as you can see, quite a wide variety of support 
um, from from coaching and, and leadership, focus on women in leadership as well, which is, has worked really well. We've got some great engagement on that subject. Um, Sector-based support, um, IP audits have, have been taken up quite significantly and are very effective in um, helping scale up companies. Likewise, with supporting companies to pitch more effectively. So there's dedicated uh, resources to um, support them with pitch, pitching and pitching opportunities. Um, right through to things like networking. Um, peer networks has, has become, again, it's come to the fore in our area in, in, in the UK uh, as a element of support that's been really well um, well regarded and um, has been a very useful aspect for scale up companies through the pandemic period in particular. Just moving on to our action plan then, um, I won't go into too much detail, but this is just one slide to summarise uh, where we've got to on our action plan. Um, we obviously went through the, the same processes as all the other partners have have uh, demonstrated in hearing about all the best practices across the, the European region, um, selecting some of those to take forward. So we selected the subsidies for entry projects based in Merthia. Uh, we also had a keen interest in two innovation programs. Uh, one, again, in, um, in Merthia was the Incuva project, and the other was the Open Innovation Project in Lazio. And we're hoping to develop um, a bit more understanding on those next year. But for the purposes of the action plan, we want to focus on the subsidies for entry project. So the, the aim that we have is to implement an early stage equity scheme to support growing SMEs. Uh, the challenge that we're looking to tackle um, with that is the low levels of equity take up in our region. We want to increase those numbers. We want to boost, use that to be able to boost the GBA figures locally, and obviously bolster employment as well. So we'll be taking elements of the subsidies project from Merthia and implementing that into our own um, plans. The, the key actions for the short term are developing a funding bid, which will go to the Growing Places Fund, which is a locally administered pot of of funding that we can access um, and that really builds on a pilot scheme that we've got running at the moment which is called road to raise uh, and is around investment readiness and support in businesses become investment ready so we're raising awareness of the opportunities around equity finance at the moment uh, so this follow-on bid if successful will be really uh, really great follow-on step to to that so we hope to implement the equity fund to support a number of SMEs uh, across the next couple of years. Um, we also want to integrate this kind of support into the next phase of economic development policy in the UK. Um, clearly, with, with the UK leaving the European Union, we're, we're, we've now in a phase of um, the government developing emerging policy. Uh, so we, we've not got um, a lot of clarity on that at the moment, but we believe it will be called the UK Share Prosperity Fund. Um, hopefully it will be similar to the structure of the ERDF fund, um, certainly in terms of what we can support. So we're hoping to integrate some of that into, into that in the future as well. Uh, another important action is around testing and monitoring the ongoing interest of investors. Um, now these, these could be local investors, could be national, could possibly be international investors. Um, and really key to that as well is not just about the cash that they can provide or would be interested in, in providing, but also around the added value. In particular, we want to leverage some mentoring support from the investors to help the SMEs in a wider context. You have um, one minute all... left, left, Chris. Okay. Thanks, Ivana. Um, all of that hopefully will, will influence the, particularly the Growing Places Fund policy um, in the UK. So the final slide is around uh, looking at the future. So obviously we will be implementing our action plan next year as a result of the learning that we've developed from this scale of projects. Um, 
as I've already mentioned, there's an evolving policy context in the UK uh, following ERDF. So we'll be positioning ourselves to take advantage of whatever comes next. But recently in October, we had some positive news from the government budget spending review, um, which has shown uh, there's a pot of £2.5 billion for Innovate UK activity for activity is a significant increase, 36% increase uh, for the next two years. So that's really positive. So hopefully we're moving in a, in a good direction still. Uh, and all of that really just to help uh, connect companies to the support that's out there um, and to, the, to, to try and um, deliver upon the key barriers that have been referenced um, by the UK Scale-Up Institute. So hopefully onwards and upwards. And that's uh, everything I wanted to cover today. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. And thank you to all the speakers we had um, during the first half of this morning. Um, so now, um, but I would just like to remind um, our participants that if you still have any questions for any of the speakers that we had this morning, please um, feel free to put them in the chat and um, our speakers could answer you through the chat. Um, and now we will have um, a five minute coffee break. So please stay on the line with us. Um, and we will start again for the second half of the conference at 11 a.m. Thank you and see you in five minutes. And we're back. And um, I just wanted to check if we have um, Marina, Marina Martinez on the line. Okay, um, then if not, I would like to introduce for the second half of the conference, we will be talking about um, EU targeted support to SMEs. And we have two um, experts and speakers who will be um, talking about several um, European programs that I think would be very interesting for, for you today, um, dear audience. And so um, to talk about the Interregional Innovation Investment Initiative, um, we have a senior consultant and policy expert at Meta Group based in Brussels with more than 15 years of work experience in various sectors and has long lasting experience in management and implementation of EU and international projects. Please help me welcome to the screen, Anita Tregner. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, apologies, my, my voice is breaking a little bit. Uh, so just to ask Ivana, how, how much time do I have for this presentation? <laughs> you have 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay. Yes, because we were discussing before that maybe there will be uh, more speakers. So um, yeah. then, you know, not to be too long, mm -hmm. because definitely this topic is... Um, a bit broad uh, in terms of uh, uh, latest developments and uh, everybody was very much waiting for this instruments to come instrument to come uh, so now that the call is published uh, there is actually a lot to say but I, I will try really to to, sk to skip to it uh, briefly but also uh, still to showcase the main elements okay let me just uh, uh, share my screen Perfect, we can see it, if you could put it in, okay. Yes. Perfect. Okay, so just to go to the, to the first, uh, to the first slides. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to warmly, uh, to warmly thank uh, to Yurada uh, for inviting me to, uh, to be together with you today. Uh, I was not participating, participating in the first part of the meeting. Uh, but I'm sure that you had a, a very good exchange and I heard a lot about the digital uh, since I joined. Uh, so uh, I also hope that uh, part of the presentation that is also related uh, to this instrument and is addressing uh, the digitalization that will also be uh, very interesting for you. Uh, so why am I, am I here? Ivana already uh, presented myself and thank you very much for that. 
so uh, the reasoning uh, for me being presenting uh, this instrument today, it is uh, also due to my, uh, let's say, you know, working experience and the history, which lately has been very much um, uh, linked to the smart specialization. Uh, because uh, due to latest project that I was involved in, uh, which were reconfirm and tough, uh, it was almost yeah five uh, more than five year journey uh, that was related to uh, working uh, with the partnerships under S3 platform for industrial modernization and other platforms as well. Uh, but focus was mostly on the industrial one and supporting them in their journey towards uh, developing, developing the investment projects. Uh, with TAF, uh, then we also have provided uh, more of the, uh, uh, how to say, um, more, more support in terms of business planning um, and further development of this investment projects towards, uh, let's say, commercialization path. Uh, and lately, I have been also appointed to be um, the army expert of the DG Regio that is supporting the, uh, the S3 platform, actually its transition um, from the GRC to the DG Regio lately, uh, and then later on to ISMIA, uh, meaning that everything that is related to, to this transition, as well as to working closely with the partnerships, in their activities, but then again, also the focus is uh, to help them to progress as well as to uh, further work on their investment proposals in, in order to uh, develop these global value chains that also this instrument that I'm gonna uh, present uh, to you about is actually targeting. Uh, so this is why I'm, I'm in the spotlight now when it comes um, uh, to this topic as well as to, as to the, this instrument. And, you know, be, beyond that, I've, I've been uh, uh, working in EU projects in general for, for a longer time. Uh, so I also hope that I have the relevant expertise uh, to, to, um, to also give the, the policy dimension as well. Uh, to present that part as, as well as, uh, you know, the, the experience in different fields apart from their regional policy, which is at the moment uh, in, in the, at the focus of my activities. Yeah, so this is just to show the, the other experts that are working on me on this journey as well. And this then leads uh, to uh, this new instrument uh, that I was asked uh, to, to tell you about, which is ERDF, Interregional Innovation Investment Instrument. Uh, and the call, the first calls just uh, have been launched on the uh, 23rd of uh, November, meaning just a few days ago. So what is this instrument about? Uh, when it comes to the Esther family, I would say that this is the most wanted and baited instrument uh, because it was in making for, for some years already. Uh, and it is a particular one because uh, even though it, it, it is uh, the instrument under Horizon Europe, but is still also the part of the cohesion policy. Um, and uh, the budget that you can see here is of 580 million that will be distributed to this uh, new uh, uh, framework period, meaning from 2021 to 2027. Uh, what AI3 is aimed about is uh, to provide funding for the interregional value chain investment projects into companies. And uh, the, the final aim is to actually scale up and accelerate innovation and bring those uh, projects to, uh, to the point of commercialization. Uh, it is very much related uh, to, the, to the S3. Actually, the S3 is uh, in the... It's the scope uh, and it's uh, and it's at focus of uh, the projects that will be uh, uh, that will be funded and and be looked at, and is very much related, as I already said, to the uh, regional innovation ecosystem development. Uh, the way how the funding scheme works is that I3 will provide grants. Um, and uh, there are type of the innovation action type of a call, which means that especially when it comes to the first uh, two uh, strands, 
uh, or you, uh, that the, uh, that actually they will be 70% uh, percent funded. While the third type of a call, uh, which is going to be launch, launched later, most probably sometime uh, over mid the next year, is going to be type of the capacity building action and the CSA, which means that is going to be 100% uh, funded. The final beneficiaries of these calls uh, they depend on the type of the call. When it comes to the first two strands, uh, they are targeting companies being the final beneficiaries. While when it comes to the third one, that is capacity building action, uh, it, it is targeting uh, quadruple helix actors and the partnerships. Uh, when it comes to the eligibility criteria, the Horizon uh, Europe rules apply. However, now that I was going through the specificity of the first calls, there are certain restrictions. Uh, so uh, I saw that uh, uh, Norway, Liechtenstein, and Iceland will not be able to apply because they are not signatory of uh, the I3. Uh, grant agreements and still actually not sure uh, how this uh, is affecting then the associated countries and the third countries uh, because uh, it was said before and this is why I have it here in the presentation that they should be eligible uh, but from it looks like uh, now that if the, those countries are not signatory of the I3 agreement they will not be able to apply but this is something that we are still uh, double checking with the commission uh, to be sure. Uh, why uh, this is uh, related with the S3 and these thematic platforms I mentioned is that be, is, is due to the fact that, uh, as I said, the S3 is very much in the scope of, uh, and, and it's at the focus of this instrument. It is the co cohesion policy instrument. So for that reason, it is also uh, the reasoning why uh, this is very much related. But it's also very much related uh, to, the, to the fact that it's uh, the policy objective one um, is at focus and it's uh, the good governance of the national or regional estuary and the measures of international collaboration that very much apply here. Uh, so I was getting a lot of questions before if uh, other partnerships or um, uh, consortiums that are not part of the S3 platforms uh, or these thematic platforms, actually, uh, would they be eligible to apply? Well, yes, but the thing is that it will be much uh, difficult uh, to, to, uh, to understand now uh, what is uh, this all about uh, and also to be able to connect uh, to, the, to, the, to the value chains that these thematic platforms, platforms have already developed. Uh, so unless you are kind of connected, you know, to, uh, to, um, to this ecosystem, of course, uh, you can, you know, jump on, on the boat, or, you know, how to say, but for those that are really not related uh, in, in, this, in this value chain and, and the ecosystem, uh, and they don't have, you know, the, the knowledge about it, it's, it will be very hard uh, to, uh, to actually have put everything together to be able to apply at least for these uh, first uh, calls that have been already launched. And this is also to say, you know, to further, you know, to strengthen why this is the case. Uh, it was also, this is part of the, um, of the call. Uh, so you can see that again, the smart specialization strategies uh, have been highlighted um, and that it said that uh, uh, the EU member states and regions that have identified, you know, uh, their, uh, their specific uh, smart specialization strategies and focuses in order to move up uh, the value chains are those, uh, are those uh, that are at the focus. Um, and that actually the approach is to re reinforce the interregional inter collaboration. Then it was, it's also stated when it comes to the I3 policy objective uh, that the uh, instrument focuses uh, to support the interregional innovation investment on the road towards uh, commercialization and scale up as I already mentioned. Um, and it's intended you know, to give the tools to overcome the different regulatory and other barriers that will bring their project to the investment level, which should be from, um, uh, which should be at the tier level six 
to nine. So everything that is less than that would not actually uh, be eligible uh, in terms of uh, the evaluation. So it is better to really have this in mind if you are planning uh, to endorse the application. Uh, then again, when it comes uh, to the policy objective, it is also to say that uh, this is a bottom-up approach, uh, which is uh, really uh, focusing at uh, concrete EU strategic priorities to be tackled as well. So it is very much related, you know, in terms of building the links in between the smart specialization and the EU strategic priorities. And for that reason, uh, you will see later on that uh, the focus of, uh, of the domains, it is in digital, it is in green, and, the, and it, in, it is uh, related to the smart manufacturing. Uh, so it is also very much needed to build uh, the synergies in between the other EU funding programs such as Horizon Europe, especially as it says here, uh, very it is very much linked also to the European innovation ecosystems, which is also the new call that has been, uh, or the new area that has been uh, launched under Horizon Europe, as well as, as it is targeting uh, synergies in between uh, with the Digital Europe program, single market Europe program, entering Europe, Erasmus Plus and the others. So, and it's said again here that uh, the focus is very much into demonstration, commercialization of, of the interregional innovation investments. Uh, and what is the path that has been taken here? Uh, so all these previous initiatives that I mentioned were helping uh, the, the uh, thematic platforms uh, to work together from learn and connect phase. Uh, and then, you know, later on uh, through different initiatives to help them to demonstrate and scale up uh, their in innovation uh, and in their interregional innovation investment proposals. And this was also, um, the aim was also to, uh, to, try, to try to help them to build the bank on the investment projects, meaning that there is a difference in between the typical, let's say, European uh, type of calls, because here uh, uh, the aim is really uh, to, to look at the investments, you know, with this bankable business scope, meaning as, you know, uh, having the business plans as you would go uh, to, uh, to go to the bank and ask for a loan. Uh, so it is really about investments. And what is the implementation scope? Uh, so I was saying, as I was saying already before, uh, this call uh, has been, uh, or this instrument uh, will be implemented uh, through three strands. Uh, so the first strand for which the calls uh, just have been published is targeting more mature partnerships in more developed regions. As I said, the, the TRL should be from six to nine and the total budget uh, as it, as it uh, has been announced is of uh, 280 million for this seven year, uh, uh, for this seven year uh, working period. When it comes to the second strand, uh, that one is targeting less developed regions. The TR level is still remains the same and the budget is a bit less uh, than for the strand one. So it comes around uh, the total budget of 280 million. When it comes to the third strand that is uh, focusing at the capacity building, that one is also uh, aimed at uh, less developed regions and the budget is much, much smaller than in the first uh, two strands, and it's about 28.5 uh, 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 million. As I already mentioned, the domains at focus are green transition, the digital transition, and smart manufacturing. When it comes to the specificities of the strands, uh, so the first one, which is targeting the, uh, the more developed regions, uh, the, the final beneficiaries should be companies. Uh, and this is also particular, uh, particular specificity for the other strand as well. But as said here, the five uh, developed regions should be part of the consortium and having at least one less developed as well. Um, and the type of the investments that are sought uh, are interregional investment in companies that are aimed to, as I already said, uh, uptake and commercial uh, that are uh, looking at uh, uptake and commercialization of innovative technologies and services. 
Um, the budget for this uh, uh, for this uh, uh, strand per call is gonna be uh, four to eight, uh, four to ten million uh, per application. There will not be many applications that will be funded due to that. More or less, you know, four to five. Uh, but as you can see, uh, the, the grant size, it's, uh, it's pretty significant. And of course, uh, there will be uh, at least every year there is going to be a call. So whoever is not going to be able to apply now in this, uh, in this first, um, first uh, call, uh, first round, uh, you will be able to then uh, apply later on. Uh, there is also a third party uh, funding mechanism uh, allowed. Uh, it, was it was initially planned that the cascade funding uh, is going to be part uh, of this uh, stream. However, now in the call, it has been indicated that it is possible to, to give the, uh, the, third, um, uh, the third party uh, funding uh, if needed, and that this amount should not exceed uh, 60,000 uh, 60, uh, 60, uh, per beneficiary. Um, for the time frame, I will also talk a bit later, but now that the call is launched, uh, the submission date will be uh, 1st of February, which is very close. Um, and then uh, I will also explain how this evaluation will go and when the first uh, grants uh, can be uh, expected to be signed. Anita, you have five minutes left. Okay. Uh, so these are the, uh, the calls that have been published on the 3rd of November. So as you can see, uh, there is uh, uh, the, the one on digit green and manufacturing, manufacturing, as I already mentioned. So these are the three topics. Uh, and it said also here that each project application must address only one of these topics. Uh, but of course, applicants can actually apply for more than one, but then they can uh, submit uh, different proposals. And uh, what is expected that, that is uh, that the duration of the projects is going to be from 30 to 36 months, and that is also possible to get the extension. Uh, this is just to, uh, for you to show what are the specifics of the first call. So it's all about uh, uh, developing the global value chain to global handle chains to support the companies to accelerate the innovation and actually to increase the capacity of less developed regions. Uh, the activities that can be funded are same for all three topics. Uh, so as you can see, it is about the financial advisory support in formal grants uh, to, for mature uh, uh, joint innovation projects at the tier level I, that I already mentioned. But also it is possible to, uh, to actually submit uh, a proposal with uh, a portfolio of different sub projects being part of the idea that you are endorsing. And this is actually what I already mentioned in terms of a demonstration and uptake of innovation. So this is just to show you the examples of the teams and priorities under this under the first uh, digit call, which is one of the three. Uh, so you can see that the, uh, uh, that what it's uh, what it's noted here in terms of what is expected uh, that is going to be proposed. So under so these are the topics uh, under the digital in, uh, economy innovation that you can have a look at and see if maybe you know some of the ideas you have could uh, uh, could be uh, the part of uh, this scope. Then there is also the digital transformation of the public administration. And then you can also see other the type of the activities uh, that are, are sought for, as well as the digitalization of healthcare. When it comes to the consortium, this is also to see uh, uh, who can be uh, the applicant. So when it comes to the coordinator, this has to be a nonprofit organization. So it's either public authority or research body or nonprofit innovation. And the coordinator has to be in, uh, established in, in, in a more developed EU country region. And down there, I also put the link in which you can, through which you can see if you, uh, I, what is the category of, of the region, of your region, so that you can know where you are placed in that regard. Also, there are some more information here when it comes to the consortium partners and who they can be. So you can see they can be from public authorities to RTOs to cluster organization, SMEs and other. 
Uh, when it comes to the strand to A, it's very similar to the strand, uh, the, to the first strand, but as it was said before, it's, it is targeting less developed regions. The TRL level is still the same. Final beneficiaries are still the same. Also, uh, uh, the funding mechanisms apply. The, uh, the difference here is that more applications will be funded and that the grant size is less, which is two to three million. And when it comes to the last trend, uh, which I was mentioned that is uh, for the uh, capacity building, it is for those that are not uh, eligible or they are not ready to apply for the first two strands at the moment. So they still have to do some type of analytical uh, um, type of uh, work, uh, some kind of capacity building actions. Uh, or whatever it's needed actually for their applications to be strengthened in order to be able to apply for the first two strands. Uh, as, as, as I said before, this is 100% funded action. The budget for coal is less, it's half a million, uh, and there will be up to eight applications that will be funded. Anita, if you could wrap up in one minute, Yes, please. I will. I'm at the end. Uh, this is just to show uh, what is important to have in mind when applying for the two strands and when I was mentioning the business plan. Uh, so all the elements that are, that these are all the elements actually that have to be considered. So you need to know value market, you need to have the partners with right capacities in the driving seat. You need to know what are the services that you want to implement as well as what is your value proposition and distribution channels. And very importantly, you need to have a very good uh, financial projection because also part of the application is to fill in the Excel form uh, with, uh, with and, uh, and to project your plan and how, you're, how actually you are planning to generate the revenues. This is just to show what are the eligible costs uh, that would apply. And when it comes to the overall time frame, as I was mentioning, so the first uh, cutoff date is 1st of February. The second one will be in October of the next year. And as you can see, when it comes to the signing of the grant agreement, most probably this is going to happen, you know, uh, it, you know, in autumn or late uh, summer of uh, next year. What I would also uh, pr uh, propose and recommend to you uh, is uh, to know more about this instrument, uh, is to join the, uh, the info day that is now scheduled for the 9th uh, of December. As you can see, uh, here is the agenda that is planned. Um, I think that your registration has been already opened for some time because the first uh, grant info day was in the envision for October. Uh, so this would be a very good uh, way to learn more, to ask questions, and then, yeah, just to, to start working on presenting the application. So thank you very much. Thank you, Anita. Really useful information to our audience. Um, so you have some questions already um, in the chat. Um, unfortunately, because of time constraints, um, I will be opening um, the floor for questions um, for you to answer um, and interact with the audience in a bit. But if you could also answer the questions in the chat, then that would be very helpful to us. Um, so I would now move on to, thank you again, Anita. And I would now You're move welcome. on to our next speaker who will talk more about the EIC, the ecosystems and the EIT. So mm. Dr. Marina Martinez at, um, is a program officer Hi. at the Spanish Innovation Agency. She is responsible for capacity building activities on European research and innovation programs addressed to Spanish entities. So Marina, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you so much for the, for the opportunity. I would like to send my kind regards to the people from the Info in Murcia, to Rafa Taz and all the colleagues uh, from the department. And I would like also, also to thanks to, to you, Rada, for this kind invitation. Uh, last minute, but very, I, I think that, uh, I hope that it will be fruitful for you as well. Uh, some of the information, I know that you already know it. Uh, so without more delay, I'm going to show the screen. Mm, the presentation that I have prepared with the support of my colleagues from the Innovation Agency in Madrid from CDTI is is a presentation which is trying to uh, let's say to give an overview on all the the the, the windows 
which uh, regarding not only the SMEs, which is uh, the main focus of the of the project that, uh, of this platform, but also on the other side, on the intermediates like the regional development agencies and other agents that are supporting the SMEs uh, in Europe. So this is uh, this is why I have uh, anti I have um, let's say put the title to my presentation. Okay, is focus on innovation. I'm going to detail more the AIC unless what it has been during the 2021. Um, but also I would like to give some elements on the ecosystems, innovation ecosystems, and the EIT, the European Innovation and Technology uh, Institute, that is another, let's say, uh, stakeholder, uh, or let's say window or um, uh, framework in what uh, innovation for the SMEs can be really fruitful and meaningful. Um, Focusing in, in pillar three uh, is, is the pillar on the open innovation for Horizon Europe. This is a new pillar regarding the previous uh, Horizon 2020 framework program. And the main actor is, of course, the European, Innov uh, the, the European Innovation Council. I would like to thank here to the Spanish team on the, on the EIC uh, at the Madrid headquarters, because the material that I'm going to show is, is an update material from, from them. So uh, I hope that it will be also useful for all the audience. Uh, so, in general, uh, the idea of the EIC was born at the second part of Horizon 2020, if you remember, uh, thanks to the Moedash Commissioner. Um, the, the idea in the height was to, let's say, to give a real, let's say, support for uh, the creation of European unicorns. And uh, through this, uh, let's say, window through the EIC to generate, uh, let's say, uh, leadership and in, uh, in uh, intellectual property right value on emerging technologies in key markets that put, uh, let's say, the European companies uh, in the forefront of, 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 the, of the economy as well at global level. Of course, for that, uh, the, the, this instrument was thought, uh, was, was a vision uh, to be an instrument that will help to reduce the risk at the first stage of the business, because it's one of the main problems when you are doing the transfer from the research, innovation, development to, let's say, to TRLs or to business read uh, readiness level as well, uh, higher, very close to market. The problem that you have is that when this part is regarding to, let's say, uh, grants finished, the, you, you have a value of date of death in the different phases of this development towards a commercial product or a commercial idea. And also, uh, the EIC is considered one of the branding uh, elements of a uh, European Commission uh, towards the rest of the world uh, in order to show attractive, uh, let's say, uh, stakeholders, companies, uh, European companies, in order that uh, it will be possible to attract private capital and investment to these uh, leading EU companies that will help them to become real leaders at global level in a specific technological markets. Um, in, the, in, the, in the vocabulary here, you see that there are two concepts. One if there is the technology readiness level, the TRL. As you see, the, you, you are going through uh, zero, which will be, I have an idea. Then you have the, the, the observation of basic principles. Then you have that uh, you can formulate uh, technological uh, uh, concepts and so, and you can try to prove it at laboratory level. And then you are following the, the devolution, the natural evolution of the technology. You will arrive until the end that that will be an operational solution or product which is ready to be commercialized or already commercialized. Um, regarding that, uh, it's typically that uh, pillar one and two of Horizon Europe can arrive maximum, let's say, 
uh, around TRL7, something similar. But it's quite difficult that these two pillars arrive until TRL8 and 9. This is difficult, but there are some actions, for instance, arriving to, for instance, TRL8, especially when you are uh, talking about pilot projects. But at the end, it's always difficult to arrive to real operational under the framework that you can find, for instance, a pillar tour for Horizon uh, Europe. That is the reason because in the win in the pillar three in the EIC, but also in other complementary, let's say, instruments of the European Union, like the EU Invest Program, uh, our Invest EU Program, you can arrive, you can reach these uh, these TRL nine, which means operational and a commercial uh, in 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 already in the market. From the other side, you have uh, the the scale uh, of the business readiness level so uh, which which is quite similar to the technology world one but is focusing more on the on the market not so uh, not so much on the technology so of course you have a business idea uh, through a product through a new let's say uh, uh, through the observation of this new potential niche of market or potential, let's say, uh, um, users or, or customers. And at the end, you have tier nine where you have approved a product and, and you have a product which is ready to be commercialized is more or less the, the main difference. In the different windows that we have at the level of the EIC, you know that the EIC, there are three levels uh, or three windows. The, the most, uh, the, 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 the ones that are, let's say, lower in the technology readiness level scale are the Pathfinder Open and the Pathfinder Challenge, uh, which are really basic, uh, basic developments or basic concepts in technologies that are really promising, but we are very far from commercial as well, but they are technologies and applications that if they are really successful in the future, they will be a market, let's say, a challenger and, gainer, um, and gamer. So, uh, and, and the other big window is just at the other side of the TRL scale. So this means when you are already close to a final product from the technological and development point of view, which is the accelerator uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the version of open window, whatever, bottom up, or challenge oriented uh, call. In the middle, you have a small window, which is really the, the belly of this, of these, let's say, two concepts. One is very low in the technology development, and the other is Quite, uh, develop, quite high development. So, and in the middle, you have the transition to innovation uh, activities. These are for those, let's say, developments which are already being proved at laboratory level, but the difficult thing is to take it out at real scale, to take it out to the street, let's say. From the other side, on the, on the on the bottom, we have the business readiness level, and you have here several, let's say, um, let's say several uh, classification or several windows. In the low TRL, you will have the, the 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 what I have explained before this transition innovation actions uh, where you have already proof. The, that, that technology, for instance, in the Pathfinder or in other elements or in other sort of projects or uh, funded at national level, regional level, or um, using uh, private funds from the companies or from the university and so, but you have already proved it. And these transition activities to innovation are the ones that uh, are, uh, are allowing you not only to hire, the technology readiness level, but also to prepare this potential product uh, to, 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 uh, and to orientate to a commercial way for the future. 
Then we have the big uh, window of the accelerator, which is taken from the moment that we have already a design of a future product from the commercial point of view. And then with the accelerator, you are orienting, you are addressing this potential product or this potential development to a more commercial way in order that you are facing, let's say, all the aspects of a product, not only the technological, but also the market. Uh, analysis, the customization, uh, let's say the, 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 the client targeting as well. And at the end, you have, uh, when you, you are developing your business, sure that at the end, you will need extra money for this, uh, for, for reaching this, the, this market. And uh, you have here the, the several windows at the InvestEU program, where there are no uh, grants at all, but instruments, uh, in, uh, financial instruments like uh, uh, invest, uh, like, um, let's say, yes, a financial instrument like venture capital, for instance, uh, or guarantees at, le at, at, at less. So uh, focusing in the EIC in Horizon Europe, we have the Pathfinder, we have the transition activities, uh, which are, uh, let's say, taking the 7% of uh, the budget, uh, let's say, and the, the accelerator, which is taking around the 73% of the budget as well. So you see that the, the, the window of the transition activities are, is, is really small, is let's say a filter for those pathfinder, uh, let's say results, which are really promising, uh, or well, it, it could be possible also to, to digest other, let's say, developments or other, other technology developments or other ideas or concepts that has been previously funded by regional programs or by national programs. But at the moment, this is still, let's say, on a training phase. Um, the Pathfinder, let's say some characteristics of the Pathfinder. So we see that in general are projects in a consortium, consortium of small and medium enterprises, but do we see technological small and medium enterprises? Remember that uh, the Pathfinder is focused on technologies, okay? Technologies that are really promising in generating new markets in generating maybe a new change in the market or new niche of a market. Uh, but that basically technologies. That means that the projects somehow are grouped uh, also in the valuation by technologies, health technologies, material technologies, uh, et cetera, ICT technologies. Um, these projects and consortium, as I have said, uh, we, they are in a technology readiness level very low. So at the end, it is expected that they reach technology readiness level three or four, typically. For the transition activities, uh, the, 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 the leaders of the projects can be one uh, uh, entity, by the moment can be an SME, but could be also a technological center, for instance. The typical thing is that could be a company because the idea of those that are reaching the transition activities are the ones that transition means that in the future they are expecting all well to go to the accelerator or well to be so, uh, attractive enough to uh, get a private investment or to go to other funds like national or regional funds as the previous speaker uh, can uh, has pointed or uh, has given some some hints on the on this possibility as well so those projects on the transition activity used to be mono beneficiary projects. Um, also, they can continue being a consortia, but here uh, there is also uh, uh, not only a, a higher TRL from the technological point of view to become much more attractive, but also a real orientation to the market and elevating the business readiness level until three approximately, which is which means to start to make a serious, let they, let's say, market study in what are the possibilities of this future technology in, uh, let's say, transfer in, a, in one product or, 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 or an alliance of products, let's say. 
of course, um, the, the continuation of, of, let's say, clustering the, the projects in, in a portfolio management, grouping technologies and so, is a continuation from the pathfinders. But the commercial point is that, the, let's say, the consortia or the beneficiary has to pass an interview and, uh, and it's a very strong filter because it's the first time that uh, let's say uh, business criteria has been in, in future commercial business criteria are going to be taken in this selection. Then we have the third window, which is accelerator, which is the main bulk of the EIC. Um, almost the 80% of the budget of the EIC is devoted to the accelerator that typically are mono uh, mono-beneficiary. Mono uh, could be even two or small, let's say, consortium of SMEs, always that they uh, show, for instance, that they have some complementarity. But typically, let's say that is mono beneficiary projects. We are talking about projects with a technology readiness level uh, starting from five onwards. This means that you have already uh, uh, test this 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 idea of product or, or or service in a let's say in a laboratory or an exploratory way and you are in TRL5 so you are out of the laboratory so you so you have been you, you have made already uh let's say a demonstration or a test in a real scale or with several real potential customers but you have still to develop things until this product or service will be ready to enter in the in the phase of certification and, and, and towards the commercial uh, the commercial path uh, we are uh, from the business readiness level we are talking about business readiness level level four which means that you have already conducted some sort of a uh, market study so you have define very well what is the target that you want to to achieve here we have as as well in the pathfinder and transition you have grants here you have a mix of grant and a financial instrument and there is also of course an interview uh, that will filter all the all the all the let's say applications that the the uh, the ASMEA agency is receiving, and uh, it's true that the filter is is really is really strong. You know, um, this is more or less uh, a summary on what I wanted to explain. So, think that for the pathfinder and the and the transition activities. So as we are already in low TRLs, uh, the, the funding rate is about 100% for all the participants of the consortium, uh, which is uh, well, private and public entities, profit and non-profit, everybody will be fund the 100%. Um, uh, in 2021, what we have already, let's say, uh, experienced is the rebuttal process in the evaluation. The rebuttal process in the evaluation means that for some of the proposers, when the evaluators has not completely clear several points of the value proposition, what they ask uh, to the ASMEA, um, let's say, um, officers is to a list of uh, doubts or q a's and then the, the the officer what is doing this is the process evaluation and eh? the process the the, 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 the the officers translate these questions to the applicants and they the applicants they have very limited time to answer these these questions that are key for the correct evaluation the correct understanding of your proposal by the evaluators Typically, the projects that has been approved are around three, four millions. And um, there has been some uh, challenges in the digital health and green deal, uh, let's say, uh, areas. Uh, so that where the, let's say, the priorities for this year, for the next year or the years to come, we will see for the transition activities, which represents very few part of the budget of the EIC, only the 70%. 
the, we continue with 100% uh, funded for all the partners which are in the consortia. Um, we have, uh, is, is, uh, the idea here is also, it is more, an, it is a mix between the pathfinder with a, a specific calls that open and close along the year. But here we have much more the, the flavor of the, of the let's say, um, accelerator. is an open window with three or four cutoffs per year small projects, the resubmission is really limited and, uh, and, and well, it, it is true that there has been open window, but uh, this year there has been challenge oriented in the digital health and of course the Green Deal. As in the Pathfinder, in the transition activities, the projects that are going to be funded are grouped in, let's say, technologies. So the role of the project managers, which are, let's say, the ones that are following the, the, the evolution of these projects is quite crucial as well, not only in the following of the projects, but also in the evaluation process. And we arrive finally to the accelerator, which is really business to market oriented. Here, uh, the beneficiaries are the SMEs uh, and mid-caps European, uh, the, uh, means from the member states, not associate countries, member states, and the, uh, the funding rate is the 70% for the part of the grant. Remember here that we have a mix of grant and uh, a financial instrument, venture capital, and is always open, uh, three or four cut off per year. There is, in general, no specific challenge. However, uh, and, and because the situation, uh, uh, actually this year there has been two challenges, one in digital and health and the other in the Green Deal, but the, the, the window of open bottom-up application is always open. In uh, 2022, it is expected also a mechanism of plugin. Plugin means that they will be regional, like the previous uh, speaker has commented, or national programs that could be able to make this first selection and acting like, let's say, the transitional activities or even the Pathfinder for those entrepreneurs or those companies that, for instance, they have started at national level or a regional level, and then they arrive to a significant TRL, which they, let's say, endorse them to, uh, to, 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 uh, to be at the same level that the projects that has been approved at the accelerator. Uh, through, uh, uh, through a specific programs, because they are not all the programs, the programs ha has to be audited by a European Commission, through these national or regional programs, these companies will be able to, accede, to have access to the accelerator also as another entry point. But this is going to be tested in 2022. I don't know, uh, is it still under debate? Uh, if we start in the first call, so this will be applied uh, by the second half of 2024. And uh, yeah, this is more or less a summary, let's say for the accelerator, remember that the part of grant, the 70% funded activities can be uh, around maximum 2.5 million euros, while the equity, let's mean the, instrument, the financial instrument can arrive to the 15 million euros when is needed. Um, and uh, well, this is this is uh, well for the uh, instruments, and this is for the bottom calls, and for the challenge-based calls that I have commented. So if you see all the instruments in the EIC, they have an open part, which is you can prepare present what you want is bottom up, but there are some challenge oriented calls in the case that commission or at European level, it has been identified some areas where innovation is needed in a really short time. I would like to thank to my Spanish uh, colleagues in, uh, in CDTI Madrid, in the Innovation Agency Madrid, 
Madrid with, uh, that, that are the ones that has provided with this information. You have here the contacts in case that, for instance, you are in a consortia and you have a Spanish partner or you are directly a Spanish partner. You don't, don't hesitate to contact, to contact them because uh, I, I have to say that they are supporting exceptionally uh, to the Spanish participants and they are doing many activities in order to uh, to, to allow that these uh, these entrepreneurs uh, will be the most successful, the more successful, or the most successful as possible. Few words on the European ecosystems. Um, this Marina, is, you have one minute to wrap up. Yes, this is the part more related to the intermediaries, the, to the intermediate organizations. You can find already the work program in the work program. Uh, well, uh, there are two sorts of destinations, the one that want to connect uh, innovation ecosystem and the others that want uh, oriented to uh, a scale up or just to uh, fostering emerging innovators and companies. And the other part is the European Institute of Technology. You already know it. Uh, uh, the idea is to strengthen this triangle between research, higher education, and the needs of the business and the companies. Um, there will be a call, uh, there is a call already open uh, on cultural and creative industries, the call 2021, and for 2022, uh, it is expected a call on water technologies as well. There has been the info day on the beginning of November as well, and I have put some examples of activities that uh, that not always the com not only the companies but the, all the members of the uh, of the kicks of the innovation communities can uh, has already can can perform uh, like uh, on the education terrain on the business development on the potential of the innovation and the entrepreneurship as well. And last but not least, I would like to encourage all of you to to subscribe you as uh, to work as an expert of evaluator of the commission, not only for the typical projects, but also for the EIC window, if you have experience in the generation of spin offs, startups, companies, you have been uh, in the in the in the marketing department. So I, I really encourage because they are looking for different profiles, not only technological profiles. Uh, profiles. We are facing the French presidency, where uh, that will start in January, and one of uh, the priorities is to uh, support the European businesses and citizens, and especially the small and medium enterprises as well. And without more, I would like to thank you for the opportunity, and I'm open to questions as well. Exactly. Thank you very much, Marina. Um, so if any of the participants have any questions for Mar Marina or Anita, I would like to leave the floor open for you guys to direct your questions to them. Um, so Marina mentioned that there is um, the possibility to become a, an expert um, in the EIC uh, panel. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And in the chat, we have a question for Anita, if it is still possible um, for experts to be included, um, if the Commission Expert Group on I3 is still open for more experts, how about for I3? Okay, uh, I answered to Costas, but uh, the fact is that at the moment, no, mm -hmm. uh, the, the group has been closed. Uh, but I believe uh, also, as uh, Marina mentioned, I mean, it's uh, always uh, 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 cyclic in terms of uh, then admitting new experts. Uh, so it is very important to be part of uh, the database. Uh, and then, you know, based on that, they, they will be, of course, then you have the eligibility uh, to, to be picked uh, for, for the role. But for the I3, it was closed uh, some time ago. Uh, so I believe that it will be uh, probably in the next year or two years when they will be opening again for the, for the new experts. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, no, it's, it's closed. And Marina, for the EIT experts, this is a continuously open um, opportunity. 
Yes, I, exactly, exactly. And it's good that you apply because I have said they are looking for different profiles, not only technological profiles, which is okay because as you see, for instance, the Pathfinder and the transitional activity, the transition activities are focused on technologies. So they are looking really for good experts on that list of technologies, but also on the other side, there is the business part. And the business part is not only technologies, but can be on, for instance, consumers experience can be for instance in entrepreneurs people that has uh, started a company and they has been uh, successful or sometimes not very successful but they have a, a very good experience and they know the do's and don'ts on the on this on this on this business no on the on their sector so they are already very welcome and of course i would like also to encourage these uh, regional local authorities which are uh, let's say these intermediate authorities that are helping the entrepreneurs because for them is also good to, to see what is, let's say, the environment of people which, is, which are applying. And I think that they can provide also a very good, let's say, point of view from the side of the ones that are helping these, these, these people to be really successful and to be the leaders of the market at global level. Thank you, Marina. Um, do we have any other comments or questions from the audience? If not, then I would like to thank again Marina and Anita, not only for sharing the available calls for regional development agencies, but as well the expert groups wherein our um, regional development um, experts and local authorities can join. Um, so now, thank you. Um, now, to give us some closing remarks, I would like to invite back on the screen Esteban Pelayo, your other director, to give us a few words about today. Yeah, I, I would like to first to thank you, Rudy, and as well Marina and, and Anita for giving us so nice uh, uh, presentations and, and very practical in, in all the sides. So uh, we are focused in this moment in, in the I3 call uh, in this, and, and we will be very pleased to, to help any other regional practitioner to be involved in, in the proposal that are going to be prepared. As, as you may know, this is a dream for all the people that has been working in territorial cooperation because it's a way to go beyond the mutual learning and to be able as well to have like a second phase from the very beginning, which is to do things together in order to support the, the companies in, in their technology development and the insertion in the, in the value chains. The same happens with the, the, the activities and, and, propose, and, and opportunities that has been presented by, by Marina. Especially, we are very focused on the, on the ecosystem in the Pillar 3. And as well, we will be very pleased to connect, because Eurada is a network in, present in 23 countries, to connect any of the participants here with uh, other uh, entities that are, are presenting that. However, I will not like to, to finalize only with the things that has been said. And I would like to recall you that we are talking about Interreg Europe and structural funds. And, and there we have a, a responsibility now in this moment, which is to really implement what we have achieved during this project and in general to implement the activities because the period 21-27 has started already and we cannot do what we have done in the previous programming period that took, in some cases, two years to, for the money to start arriving to, to the companies. I, I would like to tell you that we had to overcome some of the difficulties. Now, most of the smart specialization strategy has been approved as an enabling condition. We know the priorities in every territory. We are in the phase, and there are some draft of the operational program, and, and, and the year 22 has to be the one where we, the regional authorities, start launching the call and, and transferring the funds to, to the real economy because it's there. And as, as we have said during, during the year, during the, sorry, during the, the conference, the ones who are providing better support to the companies are the ones who are going to have a better scenario for the future. So let's try to work uh, hard on that and to bring and to be effective, providing meaningful support to the to the entities that need 
need us in, in this moment. So thank you very much to, to, to all of you, as well to the partners of the project publicly, because this, from this project from the very beginning was really, really relevant and, and has provided, has met the expectation, providing meaningful lesson learned for all the regional practitioners in Europe about what to do and how to do. And I especially thank for the good environment of sharing and, and having uh, different views and to, to design and to co-create new instruments for the scale up of companies. Thank you. Thank you, Esteban. And um, now I'd also like to invite back Rafael Atas for his final remarks. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Esteban, for your kind uh, final address. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. This was a very uh, enthusiastic and dynamic partnership uh, from the very beginning, uh, when we met for the very first time in Murcia, alongside you here in 2019. Uh, in the years uh, implementing uh, the, this project, we have been confronting uh, COVID uh, situation and we have successfully achieved to, to, to overcome those difficulties, to implement the project as was scheduled in the application form, to undertake the interregional learning, which is now concluded with the uh, promotion of our regional action plans. Uh, we, I am personally very proud of all the colleagues uh, contributing to this exercise and also the uh, support obtained from the Interreg uh, uh, Europe program and the officers uh, that uh, are assisting us in this development. Uh, they have promoted our good practices in the different in international events and also our uh, methodology in order to overcome the COVID making uh, the uh, study visits into virtual has also made the, uh, the, the, the applause and the recognition of the Interact program. Uh, it's now time to, to conclude this, this session today. And for us, it's now time to start with implementation of the regional action plans. Uh, all of them are in progress of approval and we hope to have the chance in the new uh, year 2022 a very uh, promising and nice atmosphere to implement a good, uh, a good job. Uh, all the time you will be informed and you will have uh, information accessible through URADA, which is our communication partner. We will be exploring new uh, opportunities for disseminating the good results. Um, and I will be personally very pleased to encounter you again at the end of next year for a final conference, hopefully uh, uh, on a real manner, non-virtual, uh, somewhere in Europe, probably in Brussels, nobody knows uh, where and uh, what date, but uh, we will be pleased to share with you not only actions and also outcomes, but of course, results. This will occur the case in one year period, and uh, it will be pleased uh, for me, for the scale-up projects to find you again uh, in the final conference. Thanks very much, Ivana and the URADA colleagues for your support. Thank you, Rafa. And thank you to everyone who has joined us this morning. We hope that we have provided you with the um, relevant, useful information um, moving forward. And as Rafa said, um, we hope to see you hopefully at the end of next year maybe hopefully in person um, as we also conclude the second phase of the scale up project. But for now, the road ahead for the scale up project phase one um, is done, but the road ahead for phase two is clear and hopefully we will be able to share some successful results um, with you again next year. So thank you everyone. And we hope to see you in future events of the Scale Up Project and Eurada as well. And don't forget to follow us um, on our social networks, which are posted in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Congrats, Eurada. Bye. Bye. Have a nice day. Thank you. See you soon, guys. Bye.